This is episode 260 of My Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn. Today, I'm excited to have Adam Bergstrom back on the show. Whether this is your first time listening to him, or if you've heard our previous shows, you're in for a treat either way. In this episode, we focus on refined sugar, one of the most emotionally charged topics in the natural health field. Adam shares his positive experiences with it, why he adds it to his coffee, how he's used white refined sugar for colds and flus and stress. He talks about the history of refined sugar, how the Chinese invented white refined sugar for disease. Talks about the difference between sucrose and fructose the dangers of estrogen, Monsanto's ethoxyquin, and the omega-3 relationship with sugar. I ask Adam his thoughts on cod liver oil and potential benefits that it has. He talks about cancer and some really interesting avenues that people can research. He talks about the difference between white and brown sugar, cane and beet-sourced sugar, what to do if you wake up in the middle of the night and can't go back to sleep, how Adam would upgrade hyperbaric oxygen therapy, the relationship between sugar and CO2, where Warren Buffett gets 25% of his calories from. He talks about the nuances of different sources of starch, the benefits of drinking carbonated beverages, I ask him his thoughts on Mexican Coca-Cola. And then in true Adam Bergstrom fashion, we talk about a whole lot of other stuff. Psychic self-defense, his thoughts on Mark Zuckerberg. We talk about microhydro and solar power generation. He shares what the rarest pigment is in the world, why keto and carnivore are not synonymous, the benefits of drinking grape and cranberry juice together at 5 o'clock p.m. What organ is associated with strength? The difference between having tinnitus in the left or right ear? Then I ask him listener questions, including, is protein important? And what are the best sources? Are you a fan of eating ripe fruit only? How old is Adam chronologically? Thoughts on a vegetarian diet with lots of dairy, eggs, and bone broth. How can women consume sugar without affecting their pH levels? What are Adam's thoughts on diabetes? Does consuming large amounts of sugar consistently deteriorate your brain? What are his solutions for hypoglycemia? How much sugar should we consume in one day? Lights going on randomly. What does that mean? And a whole lot of other stuff. So enjoy the show. Here is Adam Bergstrom. All right, Adam Bergstrom, welcome back. Glad to be here. Glad to be here again. I lost count. I think this is number 16 or 17 or something. So you're uh, my favorite recurring guest. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, it's uh, fun, be- fun being here. <laughs> yeah, it's always fun chatting with you about all sorts of stuff. And uh, the focus today will be sugar. And I think that term uh, is kind of nebulous. People could think it means carbohydrates or we kind of have to define what we're talking about and specifically refined sugar is what I'd like to, to uh, chat about. And you have a lot of experience with that. Um, Some people think it's a poison, but you think it's uh, medicine, right? It saved my life. And, you know, a long time ago, I was uh, read the books on sugar. What was it? The, uh, the movie star with someone else wrote a book that was uh, famous for the sugar Uh, And so I felt guilty. I still use sugar. I still put sugar in my coffee and things like that nature. When I started drinking coffee, I didn't start drinking coffee until I was in my 40s. And uh, when when Swami Swami Nitty Gritty told me it's good for my health. So he started us out on Mondays and Fridays. No, yeah, Fridays. He, uh, excuse me, Thursdays. 
He said those were the two most stressful days of the week, Monday, because you got to go back to work. And even if you're out of that, you still have to deal with banks being closed at certain times and all that regular thing. And then Thursday, because it was the day before payday and everybody was stressed and being in the nine to five uh, uh, category many times, I found that too. <laughs> I'd be down to the last buck or 50 cents, you know, waiting for the paycheck to come the next day. So anyway. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. And there's that, that funny history with coffee and, and sugar. And I want to just kind of start there with the history of sugar. I, I can't remember if it was four or five years ago now, it must be five years ago. I read Ray Pete's articles that he wrote on uh, raypeat.com about sugar and I think sugar issues and sugar and diabetes. And it's really fascinating when you look back and, and see the connection uh, specifically with omega threes, as we'll talk about, but sugar was demonized and it was kind of like a, like a marketing campaign that occurred, right. To get people off of sugar. A big one. And the candida. Uh, <laughs> business really got it going with a guy named, I think his name was Robert Crook. He wrote a book and oh, sugar then became absolutely demonized. And actually, if, if candida doesn't have sugar to eat in your intestines, it goes, it's an omnivore. It'll eat meat. So guess what? It puts out tentacles called runners and the runners go into this, drill into the cell and start eating meat. And then you can have systemic candida, which is very serious. When a person, a lot of people think they have systemic candida, but if you do, your heart is already damaged. You already have myocarditis or some kind of heart disease from it. So it's best to give it a little sugar, kind of, kind of, uh, what do you call that? Sympathy for the devil, you know, here, take a little of this and, uh, and be okay, rather than have the candida eat your meat. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was telling you before we hit record, like why I got back to sugar and I'm not consuming it by the pounds, although we can talk about that, but just adding it in, especially in the northern latitude where I don't have ripe fruit right now for several months. That's how Ray Pete talked about it is uh, kind of like a backup supply of sugar if you don't have access to high quality fruit. And yeah, I could do freeze dried and stuff and I do some of that. But um, what I'm getting at is uh, endotoxin. Uh, I was doing uh, different al artificial alternative sugars like allulose and, you know, stevia and there's all these xylitol and monk fruit. And, but allulose specifically, I, I realized I was dosing it three times a day in like keto ice cream and different things <laughs> and cereals. And I was bloated and it was just this constant bloat and inflammation. I just felt like I had a brick in my gut and it took me like a year to figure this out. <laughs> And then I just did an experiment and went to white sugar instead. And like within actually hours, not even days, the bloat was gone. Um, it was pretty, pretty incredible. So would you say, like my view is endotoxin is a much bigger deal than candida? I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. Candida is, uh, again, it's, it gets serious when you have an immunity problem or you don't give it any sugar. <laughs> so, so it's a, exactly the reverse. And Ray Pete talks about the anti-sugar cult because it, it really is here. And it started with that book. Its name escapes me now, but uh, the uh, movie star who had an affair with Joe Kennedy, whatever her name was, and, and she lived long. You can, you know, uh, I'm not telling people to go out and eat a whole bunch of sugar because mm -hmm. if you eat, if you're in an area like, us where we get fresh fruit or even tomatoes. Tomatoes have a high amount of sucrose in it and fructose in it. And that's what you really need. But when I went to a lot of sugar is because I had problems. <laughs> and when you have problems, it becomes a medicine. So I'm looking at it as a medicine. And even Swami Nitty Gritty at Donald Lay, who was my mentor, said that the Chinese have first uh, invented white refined sugar, granulated sugar for disease purposes, because it could fight diseases. Even if you get bitten by a snake, load up on sugar, because it's an antidote for the poison in many snake bites. Wow. Even wounds, right? Can you put sugar topically on wounds? 
even wounds. Yeah, it's good to make sure it's sanitary because you can't get an infection. But sugar itself stops infection. It stops uh, mold growth. It stops uh, things like that. Salt does too, but sugar will too by actually sucking the moisture out of an area. And uh, because it's, uh, uh, what is the name for that? We're basically Hydro- hydroscopic, I believe it yeah. is, isn't it? Yeah. Or hydrophilic is it, or something or hydrophilic. Maybe, yeah. That's yeah. the word. You got it. I had to reverse. It's the coffee that kicked in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I found the book, The Yeast Connection. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, that's I think that's okay. crooks. But there was an okay. earlier book, Demonizing Sugar. And uh Vibrant Gal, do you remember the name of the actress who promoted anti sugar? She lived a long life, had an affair with Joe Kennedy. She's my Wikipedia. No, nope, yeah. she can't. She doesn't know either. <laughs> yeah, I see that. the the Candida cure. There's a bunch of old ones, but uh, yeah, yeah those all came about. And and uh, I I had a friend that announced she was going on a Candida diet, and so she was eliminating things. And over a period of three years, it kept getting worse and worse. And she kept eliminating more and more and more, following the crook and those other authorities. So one day. She comes in and says, I'm tired of this. I'm, I'm down to rice now. I can't eat anything else. And, and, and she was frustrated. She comes back about two weeks later and says, I'm cured. I did a haagen fast for three days and it's all gone. <laughs> wow. so there was sugar That's... and haagen <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, it's so counterintuitive to people that have candida, right? Because the, the, the message is you got to go keto and go very low carb. Not even cut out sugar, but go even further and cut out all carb sources, even natural. That's the message. And of course, uh, what what candida is, is low immunity. Once your immunity gets low, then it happens. And also to help the sugar move along, the natural roughage in food helps. Like prunes will be 25% uh, roughage and so will uh, kiwi and other fruits. When you take roughage separate from other foods though and mix them, you get into trouble and you get, instead of promoting your uh, gut movement, you make gas. Okay. And and I think, uh, I know Ray Pete talked a lot about having a sterile um, small intestine. The sugar shouldn't go all the way down your intestinal tract, right? Right. The uh, the intestinal tract, many people think that the small intestine, which is really your restaurant, it should have bacteria in it. But no, the large intestine needs it because it furthers the digestion process. And you actually, if a person has cancer or wasting syndrome, if they if they put the, uh, the uh, uh, they can feed themselves through their anus. Because the anus can actually eat olive oil, for instance, and sugars and things like that will go in there and build them up. Have you have you ever heard of people doing like refined sugar implants or enemas? Uh, you know, I have heard of that. I can't think of the specific cases, but some people have actually done it. Yeah, I might it's have like, heard it on on one of Ray Pete's shows. Or... That's probably the most controversial thing. It's like you're putting it straight in the system. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. <laughs> well, so sugar uh, fights stress, and that was uh, a big part of Ray Pete's message. And we're talking about sucrose, right? So the white refined sugar is a combination of glucose and fructose, which collectively called sucrose, and um, and that's pretty pretty comparable to the sugar that's found in natural foods, right? You just don't have the fiber, the minerals, the vitamins with it. Right. Uh, ironically, the uh, the glucose that is our major sugar that we run in our body, when you add glucose to the mix, it actually becomes anabolic for about four to six weeks. Then you get an adrenal kickback. So when they're giving people glucose in hospitals, they're actually causing them to die after six months, when they're on for long-term periods, and that's not good. Well, well, fructose is the most demonized of all. And actually, that used to be the hero sugar back in the 80s when I managed health food stores. The, the, the 
uh, people used to tell diabetics they could take Tupelo honey because it was entirely made out of fructose. That's why it will not coagulate like regular sugars, you know, will will right. will co coagulate. But uh, when you have fructose, it won't. And fructose is the most important sugar for the liver and the most important uh, fuel for sperm. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, the the information on uh on glycogen and and Ray Pete talked about basically this this battery pack and we have the muscles and different parts where sugar can be stored as potential energy but the glycogen in the liver is like our main battery pack is my understanding and with sugar you're basically just charging that battery pack is how i think of it of the liver right that you could run on for depending on what else is going on in your system for several hours it definitely does. And estrogen is one of the things that shuts the liver down. So, mm. and a lot of estrogenic foods are out there, soy, et cetera. And plus all the xenoestrogens we have in the environment. We, everybody has plastic in their bodies now, thanks to all the plastic that end up in the reservoir and end up in the uh, ocean and whatnot. We eat seafood, we eat plastic now. You eat fresh fish you get plastic so that's inevitable and eventually uh when i was a hippie we warned about plastic we we called it uh i think uh andy warhol called it uh disney's plastic inevitable and so we didn't like plastic and i still do not like plastic do you think there's a way to get out of the body because years ago i was researching ozone and i still have a ozone generator hooked up to an oxygen tank and I do, uh, you know, I'll ozonate my cat's water like last night and, and ozonate our produce and stuff. And for a while I was doing rectal ozone and you could do in the ears, but I, I thought I came across research that ozone breaks down plastic, but I couldn't take it a step further and see if that was a good thing doing it in the body or if it makes the situation worse, you know? <laughs> It seems it would be beneficial. Uh, I think everything eventually passes through our body. We just, mm -hmm. the problem is when it constantly comes in like that. Our body actually, a lot of times the experts say, uh, oh, you, when you get nickel or this chemical in your body, you can't get it out. That's just not true because of wear and tear and uh, cell splitting. And eventually things work out of your body. But when you constantly put them in, that's not working too well. So every time you drink some water, you get some more. The trick is to uh, distill water or drink as pure water as you can and as pure food as you, you can get. You're never going to get totally pure food. They have their own toxins and poisons to defend against us, whether it's animal, vegetable or whatever. Uh, so... The trick is to eat as uh, as low on the uh, on the toxin scale as you can. It's called LD in poisons. You know, you have an LD right. that knocks you out, and sometimes a little poison actually stimulates your immunity. That's why in solar nutrition we have lunar time. You know, I, I put ketchup on my eggs uh, during lunar time. Make some uh, eat some things out of time and maybe a Hagen dazs or something like that. <laughs> so I haven't had that for a while, but I used to. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I had a show um, with a guy that owns a company, Seatopia, where it pretty much sells they sell farmed fish from different farms, and they're kind of challenging the message that wild is better. You know, because we'll, you'll go to restaurants, it's like all wild caught, and you think that's the best, but those generally have more plastics than if you're growing it in like basically a filtered pond, I would prefer to eat a, a fish from that, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it does get strange now. The, <laughs> the thing is, uh, on the oily fish, they add Monsanto's ethoxyquin because, they, uh, because they, they want the meat to not get yellow fat disease too quickly. So it's got a chemical. Now, they claim that ethoxyquin goes out of the tissue eventually. And at one time... Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw, when they bought life, when they wrote Life Extension, they recommended eating ethoxyquin. They made a wow. big deal about it in their book, and they even had the sign, the advertisement for Monsanto's ethoxyquin. <laughs> Monsanto was their hero back in 1982 when that book came out. Wow, which was a little wow. much. <laughs> yeah, that's why. And haven't you 
talked about how it's explosive. Am I thinking of the right? That's the substance? same one. They, <laughs> it, it is it is law, maritime law, uh, Coast Guard law. I forget exactly what the laws are in various countries, Norway, United States, that if you carry fish meal or fish oil or fish products across the sea, you must have ethoxyquin in it, or there's three other major chemicals, but ethoxyquin is the main one, or the sh- because, because ships were exploding and plants were exploding. So they have to use it by law. You, you know, you can't make this stuff up. It sounds like unbelievable, like a, like a sci-fi story. But it's right. true. <laughs> That's so wild. Well, that's a good segue because I wanted to talk about the relationship between uh, sugar and omega threes, and there's this thing called the Randall cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Biting with the cat for those listeners. <laughs> um, the competition between glucose and fatty acids in the cell for for creating energy, and um, there's, I I've noticed, I mean, keto and high fat that that's been really popular over the last, I mean, more than a decade, right. This started way yeah, back and you can't do both, right. You can't eat high fat and high sugar, especially refined sugar. Cause that could get you into trouble. Is that your understanding or? Well, you can eat, you can eat uh, both of them together. It's the omega threes and omega sixes that seem to have the most problems. And of course, they say they're essential fatty acids, but they're not really essential. Uh, they found out back in 1929, 1930 at Rice University that really what the what the uh, the people who uh, did the research on on fatty acids they had missed it was a B deficiency. But of course, because they were using omega threes before that for paint and and even uh, even uh, as an additive for gasoline and things like that, they lost all the money on that. So they had to come up with something. And there's a lot more money in selling it as a, a health food ingredient. Uh, but uh, omega threes really aren't essential. If you look at long lived people who live in uh, say the American Southwest, the Apaches who were very strong, very fit and long lived, they had a taboo against not only eating fish, but actually eating any animal that ate fish they wouldn't eat. So bears were off of the, off their limit. And, uh, and then the Hopis for different reasons had a, had a taboo on fish. And so did the Navajo. And they live long. The Bedouin uh, don't get any omega threes barely, and they're known for living 130, 120 uh, ages that the uh, that the experts today deny. <laughs> wow, have have you ever researched the Vikings? Uh, I I need to. I mean, I I haven't very much, but I I know the history of cod liver oil a little bit, and that's really fascinating to me because. That seems like an old invention, whereas fish oil is a new invention because it's like fish liver oil versus fish oil. And it's interesting. I was reading uh, Adele Davis's book uh, yesterday, kind of skimming it, and they were talking about cod liver oil uh, creating really healthy, vibrant children. And it seems like the star of that show is vitamin A, uh, which some people are saying now is not a vitamin, but a toxin, which I disagree <laughs> with. But um, I don't know. what. What are your thoughts on cod liver oil, vitamin A? Because I think the omega-3s in there don't really matter, especially if you're taking a vitamin E on the side. That's kind of what I do up here. That helps to protect it. Now, uh, Ray Pete was not as far down on cod liver oil as others because he said, now he said it's better to eat the cod liver whole because (laughs) then you get the benefits. But uh, but cod liver oil, if you really can't get uh, vitamin D or vitamin A, then it's necessary. What they don't tell you is that vitamin A is the natural vitamin retinol in plants. <laughs> but they do the same as we do. They make beta carotene as a secondary thing. 
Now, scientists have got it backwards today. They say that beta carotene creates retinol, but retinol creates uh, uh, vitamin uh, beta carotene. So, but you have to have baby uh, young plants. So when you get young sprouts and you get young vegetables, you get retinol, which you don't need then from uh, animal products. Uh, you have to be careful of that because you can go to the store and get baby carrots. And what are they? They're just cut down carrots. They're not you know, they're old carrots and they're not young. So if you get uh, enough vegetables, you can get it. But if you're up in the north and don't have access to uh, to vegetables, I've got Viking blood myself, being Swedish. Uh, the uh, then it can save your life by not having vitamin A or vitamin D. And uh, so it was known for a long time. Now it was also discovered about the time just before the Civil War that if you have too much cod liver oil, you will get yellow fat disease. They knew about it back then. But again, uh, it, taking it uh, taking a dose of it a day for that, I don't think it's really going to affect people's aging that much. If they live a, a good lifestyle, they're not smoking cigarettes and uh, drinking booze and doing the kind of things that people get in trouble doing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or you could do that that woman's quote, right? Like those two and, and chocolate and live a long time. Right? <laughs> yep. I was raised on uh, cod liver oil. Now, Weston A. Price sold cod liver oil that was clear. You could see right through it. And mm -hmm. so when I did take cod liver oil back uh, not too many years ago, about 20 years ago, I experimented. I followed Ravisi's idea, though. If you take omega-3 fatty acids, they will kick back after six weeks. So I always would take it like in a month cycle and then always have extra to throw away, unfortunately, because I always bought the big bottle like uh not very smart. And uh, and I don't feel it hurts you. It's the adrenal kickback from taking it over long periods, taking large amounts. And also I took it at night because it's a nighttime product in solar nutrition. But anyway, uh, I was raised on cod liver oil. I got a spoonful of it every morning at the wrong time. And here I am at 83. I just had my birthday yesterday. So Wow. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> well, so Emmanuel Ravici said after six weeks, you, does it basically like have an immune suppressive effect? Yeah, he he knew about he knew about it. Well, actually, the adrenal kicks back, and it's actually like a, a, what do they call it? They have a name for it, but it's adrenal kickback, and it can be very serious sometimes, almost uh, uh, even killing a person. But usually, they just got bad effects from it. Wow! Yeah, so you, you do like. So you'd cycle it, basically, would be the way to do it. Yeah. Exactly. Now, to me, Ravisi knew more than Ray Pete knew. I'm I'm a more of a follower of Ray Pete. And I first found out about Omega-3 through Ravisi in the early 90s. So I was already cautious of them. But another thing, there are some you, – you're going to get some Omega-3s in butter. You're going to get it in places. So you can't get too fanatic, and you cannot eliminate it. It's even tiny amounts in coconut oil. Ray Pete went so far as to do refined coconut oil to get it out, which he finally even realized was nonsense and gave that up. Uh, so you get it elsewhere. There is another acid, palmitic acid, that is a saturated fat, but it's worse than omega threes. So you know, if the if the lightning if the lightning don't get you, the thunder will, or the thunder don't get you, the lightning will rather. And uh, according to Ravisi, palmitic acid is twice as damaging to the adrenals if you take it for a while than the other, and it's actually in butter. But the main thing, coconut oil is low in it, but the one that's really high in it, the people should be wary of, is palm oil. That's the one that uh, is really not a good food to be eating. Well, coconut oil, no problem. I, it doesn't agree with me. I don't like coconut oil, but there's nothing really wrong with it, and it's a healthy oil. I know a lot of people take supplements derived from palm oil, like namely tocotrienols, but because it's so refined, it's probably fine. Yep. The tocotrienols are... Tocopherols, the four of them, are necessary for health. The tocotrienols are 
only in uh, rice and uh, palm and several other places. So obviously nature doesn't care, but there is, I don't think there is any plant that doesn't have uh, tocopherols in it. They, all four of them are ideal. Uh, some say gamma is used more in the natural form, but they're all necessary and one can semi-substitute for the other. So it's very important. A, A can be a toxin if it's combined with omega-3s, then it can actually lead to uh, macular degeneration. Uh, so you have to be careful when you combine both of them. But otherwise, vitamin A is necessary for vision, for night vision, and is a very important vitamin. That's why it's A before B, C, D, and E. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I – when I have uh, friends and people around me, it's their, their night vision isn't good. I ask them, where's their vitamin A coming from? And usually – they don't know. And so that's when I say, well, try up your vitamin A and see, because I have, I have vision like a cat at night. Like I can see outside, not to brag and pitch black pretty, pretty well. <laughs> so. That's good. Eh? And that involves the, the outside cells of the eyes. If you let your eyesight go wide, you get more nighttime vision because that's where it's coming. It's not coming from the focal area of your eye. It's coming from, which is called sometimes the predatory vision. In other words, when I focus on a thing on the wall there that I'm using, uh, I'm not using my nighttime vision receptors, but when I go wide, then you are. And also by going wide, you generate a theta brainwave. So you live longer too with wide wow. vision. Wow, that's really cool. Uh, well, so we talked about the anti-stress effects of sugar. I think you've said on the show before, uh, I think it was Vibrant Cal had a, a serious condition and uh, her life was saved with taking uh, white sugar. Was it like a, it was like a flu? That was one of the things. Yeah, yeah, it was a serious thing. I'm not going to go public with what it was, but it was very serious. <laughs> Actually, last year, uh, both of us almost died, but we're still here. <laughs> I'm glad. These are forever. <laughs> but not only for stress, but if you feel like you're coming down with something, which I guess is a source of stress, right? If your body's fighting something. You'll stop, you'll stop a cold. In fact, wow. uh, knock on wood, but we've been doing very well for a long time now since we've added sugar to the diet. <laughs> That's so counter to what people think, because you often hear it causes inflammation and suppresses the immune system is where Ray, people use it. Ray Pete say. said it can even cure cancer in <laughs> wow. some cases. You take a load of sugar. And and actually, I had a friend of mine. She got some other advice. Uh, so she was doing two or three programs at a time, unfortunately. But she had wasting uh, syndrome so bad from uh, liver cancer that uh, – that she had got down to 85 pounds. And this is a woman who was about 120. So I had her eating all kinds of sugar, and different products and holding them in her mouth, vitamins and everything, mm. because the mouth can, in an emergency, will double as a stomach and intestines. And she actually, over a period of uh, two months, gained to, got up to 105, and was mobile again because before she was totally bedridden and basically uh, shitting all over the place. She just had uh, so much diarrhea. She either lived on the toilet or her friends helped her into the bed and she couldn't move. Then she started moving around, art and everything. But then they started telling her about fasting for cancer and stuff. And that's the worst thing you can do with wasting syndrome. Your your body isn't absorbing anything. It's all coming out your rear end. You better have a strategy for getting it in your mouth and holding it. And anyway, sugar was one of the things I told her, not only because it is anti-carcinogenic, but it actually will provide calories and when you have wasting syndrome, guess what? You need calories, no matter how you get them. And I know you've talked about different uh, types of cancer, uh, and one where you, it's more acidic, and one when it's more alkaline. Would you say fa uh, cancer in general is a catabolic state? Uh, it's actually an anabolic state. Oh, uh... <laughs> you, you know, uh, 
the idea of two types of cancers first came from uh, the, the William Kelly and that school, but there aren't really two forms of cancer. Ravisi realized there were one form of cancer, anabolic, and and the other was uh, our own chemo against it. So just as our own chemo against it can kill us, just like external chemo, the other one can too. So in other words, uh, cancer grows without oxygen. It, it actually grows. But when you provide oxygen, you now have metastasis. And so alkalinity will make metastasis. If you have a cancer that is anabolic and doesn't spread, like, say, uh, a skin cancer or what's the other one? Oh, a, a uterine cancer. Then it's OK to uh, provide oxygen for it and, and, and an alkaline diet because it, it spreads by uh, by troops marching rather than the air force like other ones but if you take ovarian cancer and you become alkaline for that it spreads by air force and pretty soon you got it all over the place that's the main thing with prostate cancer and king chuck should uh, pay attention to this that the treatment that they give any type of surgery causes shock and that causes spreading a Prostate cancer is so slow growing. They say that if you're 100 years old, you have prostate cancer if you're a male. There's just no getting around. 99.9% of males do, but it doesn't hurt them. Uh, but when you provide alkalinity, especially with any kind of chemotherapy, radiation, or even surgery makes you highly alkaline uh, for a few days, then bingo, it's on, it's on the loose. You let it out. They, who let the dogs out? You know. Wow. What What are your thoughts on uh, Steve Jobs? Because he was fruitarian, right? He was eating a lot of sugar, but but, but he he died of pan was it pancreatic cancer? I believe. Yeah, and he ate a lot of fish too. He was a pescatarian. <laughs> oh. okay. So he's combining. Interesting. Yeah, and, and again, fish isn't that bad, particularly the dry fish. When I say dry fish, think. Uh, people think nowadays, uh, I think the, the term has changed, like you dry the fish out. But a dry fish is one like cod. All of the liver, all of the oil goes into the liver. The fish itself is almost free of omega-3s when you eat it, and fluke and flounder and a lot of other fish you can look up. And then, of course, orange ruppy lives 300 years, and it has the lowest of DHA and EPA on the scale. They say don't eat it because it doesn't have any, yet they live 200 years and a salmon uh, is lucky if it lives nine years. <laughs> wow. I'll have to see if I can get some of those into the lake here. That'd be great. <laughs> it's funny. Oh. Omega-3 works really well if you're in a very cold environment. And I mean, very cold, like a uh, uh, hundred feet under the ocean. Uh, and in the Arctic, Omega-3 is one of the factors that keeps a shark that they think maybe lives longer than a thousand years. But when you get in a warmer climates and warmer bodies, like a warm blooded, blooded human, that's where you get problems. And again, I'm for minimizing, not not avoiding, because frankly, there is no way you're going to avoid omega three fatty acids, no matter what you do. <laughs> and the trick is to keep them low so the liver handles them and pushes them out, and they do what they're supposed to do and don't accumulate. It's the accumulation of things above the LD ratio where where your body can't handle things that the problem is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I grew up eating a lot of candy. You know, every Halloween, I'd have a, a pillowcase and we'd fill it up with me and my friends. And, you know, the next month I would go through at least half of it or something. And looking back and now when I'm at, you know, at the grocery store, Walmart, whatever, if I go through and I look at the ingredients of Kit Kat bars, Snickers, uh, what do they eat? Jolly Ranchers, uh, Sour Patch Kids. I mean, all the stuff I love, <laughs> Red Vines. There's all these chemicals in with it. And then the same thing with uh, sodas, even the sodas in glass. You look at like, like I think Fanta or something. And you look at all the colors and stuff. 
And I think people tend to associate those with sugar, right? Like the red number five and yellow, whatever. And that's really the problem in candy and soda, right? It's not like the sugar is probably the best part in those. That's the best part. Then they mess it up with all the chemicals, just <laughs> chemical warfare. Yeah. I, as a kid in the fourth grade, uh, third and fourth grade, I lived in Maywood, New Jersey, and I lived in a highly apartment area. So trick or treating, we could go out with our bags on multiple loads and we had the floor like six inches deep in candies and things. And we we went at it, you know. <laughs> we ate so much of that stuff that uh, it was unbelievable. And finally, after a certain amount of time, my mother would just throw it away in the garbage. There was so much of it. Uh, so I've eaten my share of that. I think they had some worse chemicals back then and some less worse because they keep on inventing new chemicals. In your red number fours, all these coal tar uh, dyes that they have, which are very similar to estrogen, by the way. So you're getting estrogen when you're taking coal tar uh, dyes, something Ray Pete pointed out. That estrogen was so easy to to produce, they got it right out of the chimneys. And because all the varieties were there, these chemical, the, the companies that make estrogen made all the varieties out of chimney uh charcoal basically wow and i'd imagine consuming something that acts like estrogen with sugar at the same time probably isn't good for your not a good idea but the sugar will give you some buffering from the estrogen if if you if you insist you want soy or tofu eat some sugar with it (laughs) i'm trying to remember if they added omega-3s like a sunflower oil or, or something in candy not that I can recall. Do you remember any of that? that? I think they added to some of them, they add some oil and things like that. Uh, in small amounts of that, the amount they would add probably wouldn't make too much of a difference. What they've done is demonize the short words. If it's, a th- if it's three letters, four letters, or five letters, fat, salt, sugar. <laughs> but the big ones are okay. If it's a really long chemical name, must be good for you. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. Um, And you've talked, I think, before about white versus brown sugar. And this is a a question I get a lot, especially like two years ago when I was posting my bags of white sugar. People were saying, why don't you go for the less processed, more natural brown cane sugar? Um, But you've said that that's just basically a coating that they put on. Yeah, in most cases. Now, Swami Nitty Gritty had a clinic and he had a, a restaurant at one time going in Houston, Texas. Uh, and he went out to the cattle ranches and got raw sugar. Raw sugar, people don't realize, is illegal in the United States. But he went out there and said, I'm a cattle rancher. I want sugar for my cows. So he got 50 pound bags of it and took it home. And then we would have. I know what raw sugar looks like, and it doesn't look like the stuff you buy at the store. The most you get in a store is called blonde sugar. And basically, in most cases, maybe not in blonde sugar, it might be semi-refined. But in when you buy brown sugar, they basically put it in a car wash and spray paint it with, uh, with caramel back in which is burnt sugar basically they take burnt sugar and put it over and people think they're getting a healthy sugar and a natural product and in probably 90 percent of cases or 95 they're not now sugar cane i've eaten in hawaii you just eat eat the cane itself that's fine and uh, blonde sugar uh, there was a problem with uh, viruses because they use bone Uh, animal bone with prions to filter it. So I stopped eating blonde sugar because at first I thought, well, at least blonde sugar is semi. Now, since I just want the carbon, the hydrogen, and the oxygen and the sugar, I get all of my minerals and I get all of my other uh, nutrients in other food. I don't care if I have uh, a little white sugar for stress. Again, it's a medicine to me when I take it that way. And some days I don't take much at all. 
I always have some of my coffee uh, and I sprinkle a tiny amount in my uh, potatoes even and uh, to make kind of a little flavor, just a little bit though, too much, it gets too sweet. But if I'm under stress, you can bet I've uh, I've had an abscess where I've eaten, uh, golly, I don't know, a, a cup of sugar in in a short time, fifteen minutes, and sucking on it to uh, to get rid of the abscess. And wow. uh, I also use aloe and other things, but sugar will a minor abscess sugar will stop just like that. Wow. It works on bed sores. It works on all kinds of things, and it even helps tooth decay. That's the weirdest thing of all. <laughs> yeah, you've said that tooth decay is really caused by uh, starch that sets on the teeth, right? If you notice, when you eat a cracker, it all sticks around the uh, the lining of the teeth, and uh, and that's where the bacteria go for it. When you drink sugar, especially if you you could rinse your mouth after by swishing your mouth out, it goes down to your stomach. It's nowhere near your teeth. And here's the funny thing. Suppose after a meal you hold sugar in your mouth. What does it do? It makes you salivate. Me, I start drooling all over the place. That's alkaline saliva that kills the very bacteria that you're supposed to be uh, avoiding. So actually, swishing your mouth with sugar afterwards can be beneficial. And then once you start drooling, you can have a little water and squish that out in case some of that sugar should get in there. But uh, it's really omega-3s and estrogen that cause most of the tooth decay, estrogenic foods and things. And the sugar actually protects you. And, of course, they, it, get, it gets a bum rap that the sugar is causing the problem. My teeth broke down before I found out about sugar when I was starting to cut back. And the worse my teeth got, I thought, well, I got I to gotta really concentrate on only having one teaspoon of coffee, a, tea, <laughs> a, a sugar of my coffee instead of two. Not realizing that it was a combination of the tuna I was eating every day, uh, every day, and the mayo, which also has some omega-3s in it. And... Uh, and I was dying basically in 2015 until I switched to sugar, oranges, gave gave up my tuna, even though it was canned. It still had it has it has it, a canned tuna has a lot less than regular fresh tuna, uh, but still, and and because I was on a budget, it had olive oil. It was packed in, and so the omega threes went into the olive oil. I poured that off, of course, and ate the tuna, so I got even less. But still, you can't do that every day. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and even when I was uh, out of high school and, and working at Thrifty Cutthroat Drugstore and places like that, I had tuna sometimes two or three times a day. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I've always been uh, overly fond of tuna. And that's one of the highest fish in omega threes, right? Yeah, if it's raw. Now canned, I was lucky. If if mm -hmm. it was, if that omega three, if I'd got the water pack stuff, I would be worse. <laughs> but I was on a budget, so I was getting a ninety nine cent uh, Walmart stuff or Costco <laughs> stuff. I guess it was. I'd buy I'd buy yeah. cases of it to so that I have like a month supply or two months supply. Well, like when you said you're just after the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen from sugar. I watched when I started on CNH years ago, you know, that's one brand, a main brand you could find at big box stores of, of refined sugar. I watched uh, a video of their factory processing, and I believe it's like 60 to 70 times that that sugar is processed. And uh, I, maybe you're the same. I'm kind of the same way with... So, you know, processed is not always bad, which is another mantra that's been shared. <laughs> Sometimes ultra processed is better than the raw thing, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it's like when you uh, su suppose I came in and was selling uh, vitamin C and vitamin A and said, this is unprocessed. It's got all kinds of other stuff. We don't know what's <laughs> in it, but, you, you know, there you eat it. It's the same kind of thing. But when it comes to sugar, oh, no, that can't be processed out in pure. I mean, they advertise pure vitamin C, pure vitamin A, pure vitamin B1, whatever it is. The, the thing is also uh, one of the things about if you really got brown sugar, they used to burn the crop down so they could easily harvest it. Now they use glyphosate to chemically burn it. 
And so when you're eating, if you were getting really brown sugar, you're getting a load of glyphosate. The purer they get the CH and O, the less glyphosate. So by eating white sugar, I'm getting less theoretically. But because they're now, God knows where they, they're probably just getting white sugar for the caramel. They have several other processes I found out too that may be actually using some of this of the sugar plant when approved by the FDA. Because if you check the FDA laws, they believe that uh, unrefined sugar is okay for animals, but because it has might have other toxins in it, it might be the chemicals and pesticides we're talking about, they uh, rule it out for human beings in the U.S. Other countries, I haven't checked their laws, how they handle that. Wow. Have you found a difference between cane and beet source? Because I did a short experiment several years ago uh, with beet sugar and i didn't there was something off where i only did it for a few months and then i went back to cane sugar it just didn't feel this clean you know uh, i uh i used to eat beet sugar at night and so in nutrition cane sugar in the middle of the day and date sugar in the morning but now because almost all beet sugar is gmo i pretty well have let that go and i just have cane sugar at night and let it go uh, you can get beet sugar that's non-GMO, but it's really pricey. And so <laughs> yeah. it just isn't worth it to ha have the little sugar I eat at night, which is not that much, unless I wake up in the middle of the night and I feel I'm uh, under stress. Or, uh... In fact, that's a very important thing, by the way. Sugar, when you wake up at night and go to the bathroom, uh, it can prevent a heart attack. Uh, 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 many heart attacks occur in the middle of the night at lung time, which isn't a true uh, heart attack. It's a, uh, a respiratory heart attack. In other words, the heart can't get oxygen, so you die. <laughs> wow. But sugar will actually prevent that. Now, I have, a, I have a grammar school buddy that I'm still in touch with, and he's not going as far as I am with sugar, but he keeps a sugar cube by the bed now. And when he goes to the bathroom, he takes that and puts it in his mouth right away. That's all you need is a sugar cube. But it can actually save lives because so many people die of heart attacks at, at night. Wow. Yeah, and I know Ray talked a lot about sugar suppressing or lowering cortisol, which is helpful if someone either gets up in the middle of the night like you just described or they can't fall asleep both ways, right? Sugar can help. That's when you want to, the cortisol gets highest at night. And that's uh, exactly uh, what uh, kills people. And the sugar is anti-cortisol, so it blocks it. Now, I believe you need a certain amount. You don't want to, you want to, uh, what do you call it, stunt the tide. There is a cortisol tide that I think needs to be honored because getting high cortisol at night means you get lower during the day but you don't want it to get too high and most people in our stressed out world especially for the last four years or so <laughs> you need to slow that down a little and a little sugar isn't going to destroy your cortisol cycle it's just going to lower it enough so that you don't die of a heart attack in the middle of the night interesting yeah and i'm glad you brought up oxygen again because we've talked about that before on previous shows and I have a lot of experience with hyperbaric oxygen. And I think recently, a couple of weeks ago, you made a post on how, uh, you know, you, we've written a lot on hyperbaric on social media and why you think if we just used carbogen, which is what, uh, let's say, six or seven percent carbon dioxide, there would be no no negatives to it. Whereas right now, it there's negatives to using pure oxygen. There, there are some, uh, there's positives and negatives when you use pure oxygen. Now, I found out that a lot of ox people on oxygen tanks, oxygen will kill elderly people by doing that. But I found out depending on how close you put the, uh, the device to your mouth, you can get anything from 14% oxygen to 100% oxygen. The 100% is the most dangerous and actually causes brain damage. But... You might not even notice it. You know, it, it, people might think in 
five or six years, I got dementia and not realized where it's coming from. Uh, back in the day, when miners went down and they put oxygen in the mines, they actually added one to two percent uh, uh, carbon dioxide. And in fact, carbogen comes now, I believe, in three percent, five percent, and seven percent. They use they use it for various therapies, like they say. If you can't handle 5% carbogen, you can't handle psychedelic drugs. That's what they use it for today, mostly. But if you look at a 1932 article in, uh, in uh, Popular Science, they said, new discovery, carbogen, it cures pneumonia 100%. If you come in the hospital, people die of pneumonia often, but now you just give them carbogen and there's no deaths. Wow. But they weren't rediscovering them. I have a book from the 1850s, I believe, where people used to have swimming pools. Carbon dioxide comes out of the ground in Germany. So they had a spa where you get in a swimming pool of gas or they have private ones for people who have money, more money to go in those. And they cured cancer and all kinds of diseases with it because to get oxygen into your body, you need carbon dioxide. If you get nothing but oxygen, you shut off your oxygen and keep it superficial. Even hyperbaric people and divers knew that by cutting off your uh, oxygen supply, you can drive it into the body and you don't even need red blood cells to stay alive. <laughs> That's the amazing thing on carbon dioxide. That's really interesting. Well, I, I know in the chambers, uh, you always wear a mask and it's basically either one or two oxygen concentrators, maybe even more at some point, but usually like an one or two oxygen concentrators and that's pumping pure oxygen into your mask while you're in that pressurized environment between 1.3 and two atmospheres usually is what people can buy on the open market. But uh, you're making me think like when you said the distance from the face matters, maybe not wearing the mask. I actually have a CO2 meter. I'm going to experiment just testing the ambient CO2 while it's pumping in the oxygen. Cause I, my exhale constantly adding CO2 in that sealed wow. environment. Right. So I thought of even <laughs> breathing slow. If you breathe slowly, wouldn't you generate more carbon dioxide when you're in a hyperbaric chamber? Uh, you know, the carbon dioxide is something my friend, George Wellington Adams, uh, didn't know about. He was an expert and actually is the reason we're using hyperbaric chambers today. And he was a, a buddy of mine, a, a Marine called the Leather Tiger. He was a deep sea diver, went all over the world for the oil companies and things, trained the astronauts in, for flotation stuff in swimming pools. And, uh, and he brought it back before the Second World War. In St. Louis, I believe it was, they had a four or six story hospital, totally pressurized. You went into pressurized rooms and they were curing people left and right. There was some famous uh, multimillionaire that was behind it. His name escapes me right now. And they had this hospital going. The whole hospital was pressurized. And it was safe because a lot of the older devices blew up and people uh, died. Well, when the Second World War came, they needed the metal. So they tore down the hospital, made tanks and, and ammunition out of it. And my friend George in the 50s, he knew all about the history of it. And because he was a deep sea diver, he popularized it. You can see in the old newspapers, there he is saying, we have to bring this back. And so he worked with the U.S. Navy back in uh, Maryland. They have a base back there someplace. And he worked with the ones uh, the, the U.S. Navy has a, a hyperbaric chamber in San Antonio, Texas, of all places. So he worked with them to, to bring it back. And he actually, George Wellington Adams, is the reason. With wow. Swami Nitty Gritty, the three of us were going to build a hyperbaric flotation tank how about that that's cool but that's cool. It, it never came about uh, certain things interrupted the process <laughs> wow yeah i actually am I'm having another show on that uh i think next week or the next two weeks on hyper on uh sensory deprivation floating and that's that's a fascinating thing that was uh was it timothy leary that used that with dolphins or something 
That's a crazy yep. story. <laughs> yep. And and uh, Byburn Gal's uh, former husband, he ran one of those stations right here in uh, in uh, uh, Santa Barbara. For wow. years, yeah. <laughs> so wow. she's familiar with it. Interesting. Yeah, I took More a break than on me. I've never floated. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done it in a while. We're hyperbaric. I'm trying to just experiment of taking a break from everything. But uh, that's that's fascinating. It, uh, all that stuff you described about hyperbaric and the history of it. Sugar increases CO two. Is that right in the cell? It definitely does. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good way to get it right there. And and by the way, uh, when you get carbon dioxide. Uh, again, you can theoretically feed cancer because it's anabolic. But uh, again, if you eat other regular food, that's just not going to happen. Unless you eat nothing but sugar, then you could do it. Uh, but the uh, the but also the sugar will stabilize cancer so it doesn't metastasize. Sugar is the enemy of metastasis. Uh, now, glucose, that's not true. You get the adrenal kickback, and now you can make it worse. But if you're eating sugar, it actually will help uh, your survivability of cancer. Wow. Did, did you learn that from Ravici? Or? Ravici. Ravici. Ravici first. Yep. Wow. What? Um, I'm sure people are wondering, are there any uh, books or uh, I think you might have posted there's like a PDF online of his material? Uh, <laughs> yes. And it's now they've made it more complicated. It's harder to use. It used to be really simple. That crazy pharmacist, I forget his uh, actual name. He posts it on the site and you can use it. I have two two physical copies I was lucky enough to get before they were out of print. But uh, but it used to be really handy for me. Now I use the book because they've made it harder to read. But you can read the whole thing uh, online, on the Internet. And I, I recommend eventually that's going to come down. And I recommend people, if they can make a copy of it for themselves, it might be a wise idea because it really is a classic book. I refer to it. I, I've been studying that thing since 1990 and even was going to go back in and study with Ravisi. He was going to let me uh, come back and talk to him. Uh, wow. I called the niece and she said, what kind of doctor are you? Say, I'm not a doctor. She said, oh, kind of uh, like uh, that was not going to be good. But, but then I said, but I've read his book three times. OK, let me talk to Dr. Ravisi. So I got a call and said, he says, come, come anytime. <laughs> He'll talk to you. <laughs> he was really wow. accessible guy. And uh, I didn't go. And my co-author of Yes, No, Maybe said, you're going to regret this, that you didn't go. And I don't know. I, I Sometimes I have regretted it because I missed a chance of meeting a great man. I sent people to him for cancer and uh, for AIDS even because he had wow. uh, he had a cure for AIDS right from the beginning. He knew exactly how to treat it. Uh, in fact, AIDS, AIDS as a disease is always anabolic. So you treat it with an alkaline diet and alkaline drugs. Uh, once you get the... Uh, uh, the syndrome you're breaking down and those are actually the, the equivalent of metastasis. It's not AIDS. It's the, uh, it's the, uh, the, the syndrome of uh, happening. It's in other words, it's, it, it, it's not the virus, it's the disease. And that has to be treated another way because obviously you're breaking down and you need anabolism to keep from dying then. Yeah. Was his book, is it Research in uh, Physiopathology as Basis of Guided Chemotherapy? That's the one. And I have, I thought, okay. Even though I've read that book over and over and over, I'm, I'm probably reading parts of it, have probably read the thing about 10 times. I've also written a book, by the way, called Cancel, Not Cancer. Mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. which is based on Ravisi's for people who want further information. I've tied in various things that aren't in that book because other authors have written about it. Uh, I can't think of the name right over there on my shelf that I have. And there's one by Dwight Moody. Is that his name? Something like that, who wrote a really short 25 page book that really has some things that were missing out of the book. 
the Ravisi Clinic, when I dealt with it in uh, about 2005, is no more. They canceled it. His niece ran it for a long time, and they had a lab and everything. Uh, only I noticed that they didn't have the exact technology Ravisi had. Ravisi was so – he just – it was an amazing person. Hitler actually had a uh, dragnet out to get him because he had invented an oil back in the days for aviation fuel, and they wanted his his use. Instead, he went into the French uh, uh, resistance and invented a drug where they wouldn't bleed out after they got shot. Wow. And then he he. Uh, smuggled secret information i think it was in his mouth or something like that a <laughs> microfilm when he left from morocco to mexico city where he had a t- turned a hotel into a hospital was discovered by the chicago uh uh group up there the uh the hospital up there and after they pumped him for information they basically fired him and called him a quack and now have a lot of cancer research that you hear on oncogenes is rabies under a different name only they use it very sparingly and they basically abuse them and they call them a quack and actually at one time even uh what is that famous hospital in houston they had four re- four things that Rabisi discovered that no one knew and thought was ridiculous, like selenium for cancer and mm. things like that. That was considered quack, uh, being a quack. Yeah, I can't think of that famous, famous cancer clinic there. It's BC, an amazing, amazing, amazing scientist and doctor. Lived to 100. Wow, that's a pretty good. Yeah, it's a pretty good age. That's it's, a good it, recommendation. <laughs> it's interesting how many therapies came out of that World War II time. Uh, I was listening to a. Uh, they got back into coffee enemas. I was listening to a show about that. I don't know a month ago or something, and she was talking about how uh, uh, the Third Reich were, was using. They were used coffee enemas as uh, a painkiller. So I think they were using water enemas or something, and then they tried. They were making the nurses had so much coffee available. They just decided to try coffee in the bags and the soldiers were getting so it was just a a really affordable medicine. But there's so many things like that, right? I think they were experimenting with so many injections too. I actually have a a book on that. I think it's called Blitzed or something of drugs in the Third Reich and the uh, all the the glandular extracts um, that that Hitler was injected with. I mean, that's. It's it's funny because now in the biohacking space, it's like peptides have been trending for a while, <laughs> but that was being used during World War II. I mean, probably a more archaic form. I think they were taking straight like from the gland or something. <laughs> but... You know, Germany is very interesting. The origins of solar nutrition even go back to uh, not only Mongolia, but then they go into Germany in about 80... 80- uh bc no ad ad there was a uh, a roman attack and they were driven out and the uh the technology then was for natural remedies it ended up in 1800s when the nature boys were uh, were created many of them migrated to the united states including gypsy boots and eden abez and other ones one was famous down in palm springs who played a guitar and was the prototype for the hippie he was a friend with rudolph valentino and many movie stars and he just lived out in the nature gypsy boots lived by the hollywood sign and slept there when he wasn't down in palm springs uh getting dates i knew gypsy personally he was quite a guy but anyway the gypsy boots the 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 nature boys were recruited by hitler into the brown shirts so they had a health food uh uh movement 
uh, Hitler was supposed to make everybody in Germany a vegetarian after a certain amount of time and no cigarettes. But he also realized for practical reasons, if we take cigarettes during the war, we're going to have a rebellion here. So we're not going to do it. So ironically, the brown shirts were a, a continuation of the nature boys, but they were perverted. They're, they're nature boys who uh, didn't want Nazism. They evacuated and came to the United States. A lot of them were living in California. Again, they were the prototype probably for the hippies, his long hair and sandals way before hippies ever came about. Interesting. Yeah, we watched a documentary recently on uh, animal animal laws around well, around that time when Hitler was in power. And I think he was the first one in the world to actually ban animal uh, experimentation, like just ban animal uh, cruelty in labs and uh it, it's so fascinating just that vegetarian side of him it was, it was yeah kill human beings but animals <laughs> that's what we're getting now here in california they have a they're they're gonna redo 101 so that some animals can get under the freeway mm-hmm. easier tear it wow. apart for 10 million dollars i think just wow. so they can run on through and meanwhile we got homeless all over the place and uh, migrants invading every place so it's really it's, become crazy it's gone the other way yeah that's wild well you mentioned uh AIDS and we've been talking about cancer. I forget if I've asked you this in any of our previous shows. Have you ever heard of Bob Beck? Uh, Cause I came across him years ago and it, the, the protocol, like he, he invented the, like a pocket radio, 1937, at the age of 12 and portable photo flash. He was just like really into electronics, like picked him out of the trash and would like break him apart. And he, inv- he basically released pat like a uh, release these schematics so people could build like a micropulsor. This is like the real original zapper. This is like before Halder Clark, mm-hmm. like to put like micro amps into the radial and ulnar to clean the blood and then uh, making colloidal silver to drink. And then it was, this was like a four step protocol and then drinking ozonated water and then PEMF to like get the current deeper into the body. But uh, it, it seems like there's a million like you could call it cures for all these conditions, right? <laughs> yeah, and a lot of them, you have to look at the actual results because uh, mm-hmm. when people tell me about that, I like to see for myself mm-hmm. who's mm-hmm. Uh, dealing with it. Of course, the most miraculous cure I've ever seen, and I think it had to do more with, with her will to live. My friend Judy Utley, and I probably told you this story before, Uh, She came to me for a mind hacking session. And during the time I did an alignment on her neck. Well, her eye drooped and wouldn't go back. So she said, what's wrong? And and I do really light adjustments. So I, uh, uh, I said, I have no idea. So she went to the doctor, got tested, came back, goes to the doctor for the results. He said, how did you even walk in this office? Get your affairs in line. You have spinal cancer. You have breast cancer. You have liver cancer. You're riddled with cancer. You shouldn't be even able to walk in here. Go get your affairs in order. So she came to friends of mine's house, and I happened to be there. And she was, we thought, bye-bye, Judy, you know, a, you know, a week. She heard about this. these two women down in San Antonio who basically used black sab. They burned a hole in her back about, oh, 10 inches wide. I saw a photo of it. And, uh, and she had a miraculous cure. She lived for nine years. They, they, she went back every year for cancer. They couldn't find a cancer. Her doctor who diagnosed her got lung cancer. She tried to tell him about it. And, uh, he didn't pay attention and he died within a year. And so he, she outlived him six more years. Now, I think there was a lot of consciousness because Michael Tierra, if you've heard of him, the famous herbalist from uh, Esalen, written books on acupuncture and herbology, uh, he, uh, he went to investigate these two ladies and couldn't find a single legitimate cure. And uh, yet he never interviewed Judy Utley. So was it life force or not? Because 
she told me that she wanted to live to find her, uh, what do you call it, soulmate. She wanted to find her soulmate. So she found him, and within a year, they both died. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so whatever that was about, she told me she just wanted to live long enough to meet her soulmate. She met him. She never gave up smoking, by the way, chain smoking, while she had the therapies and everything like that. She did carrot juice anime. She did colonics. She did all these other things. I, I met the two ladies who were actually clients of mine when I went down, when I was hanging out with Judy while she was going through this. But I like to see things with my own eyes. And that was just absolutely phenomenal because I really thought Judy was going bye-bye uh, wow. that day when she first got cancer and that diagnosis. Wow. By the way, Adam, there's like a rattling. I don't know if something on your desk is hitting by the mic. It just sounds like a kind of like a something's hitting something I you know, know it just... might be as i'm moving around the... oh that's i, I think that, that might be it yeah that <laughs> happened once when i was doing the show with patrick back in the day <laughs> oops i think i just did it again <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah okay i'll hold it <laughs> that's no what I used to do. um yeah that's fascinating it's i think it, it's so important to uh surround yourself with people whether it's neighbors or <laughs> friends or family that don't cast these negative verbal spells on you, like talking down to you and especially these doctor diagnoses, but it happens at a, a, a mind, like a small level day to day, right? Which is people around us. If they're constantly programming us with their negative thoughts that they're projecting. I think the mouse is the greatest cause of diseases. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, a friend of mine had a uh, terrible colon problems, gangrene of the intestines, multiple surgeries and everything. Uh, I talked to him just before he died. And when he died, uh, I was so, he was such a close friend of mine that I just burst out crying. And within one day, I had an inguinal hernia on the, on the left side, which I've been living with now for over two years. <laughs> so, wow. so it shows you how the mind ha happens. And someone else once called me and asked me, uh, what the heck is the condition again? Again, I'm a geezer with dementia now. So uh, uh, whatever the condition was, it's when it starts like a trigger finger and then it, there's a, a growth, uh, it actually gets hard, and uh, there's a technical name for it. But anyway, you see my finger right there? It's a claw. And that started from that. When I answered an email to help someone with that, it suddenly got hard there. I ran into wow. Vibrant Gal, and I said, look, look, it's, you, you're a witness. Look what just happened. Well, I rubbed it out, it went away, and then suddenly it came back, and it wouldn't stop bending and bending and bending. So now I have a claw on that side over answering a uh, email over someone. So we have to be very careful. Uh, I, I wrote a whole book called Mesmerism and Miracles about how these kind of things happen, how genetic diseases have been cured by mesmerism and hypnotism. And my point has been, why not just auto mesmerize, auto hypnotize, auto suggest and get over these things because we've been sold a bill of goods that our mind is weak. Genes are more powerful. Doctors are more powerful. Everything is more powerful, but you're just a puny victim and we're here to help you. We're the public health people. We got, we got everything from uh, every kind of drug you want to make you well and you can't get well yourself like our pioneers did, what happened to hunter-gatherers and, and the original farmers and everything like that? They got well. You said on the show you want to, is it, sim, uh, was the difference difference between sympathizing and empathizing? Is that, do I have that right? That is important. <laughs> if you, when you empathize, a person is seasick and they're throwing up over the side of a boat. You pat them on the back and say, it's all going to be okay. Everything's nice. If you sympathize, you throw up with them. That doesn't help them. And as Gibran said, basically, never limp before a crippled man. It doesn't help them at all. <laughs> right. I, I think for people that have genuinely good intentions, uh, 
they tend to be prone. I know I do to going more sympathy than empathy. And that's when we run into problems, right? I've had that too. So a lot of times I would have problems. The first time it happened to me, I was going to a Donald Lay school, the Texas Institute of Reflex Sciences. And a good friend of mine who was a, uh, a fireman, uh, he'd been to a medical doctor, he'd been to a chiropractor, no one could help his back. So I did reflexology on him and his back got better. And and he was emotional. He cried. He was so glad to be better. I went over to a friend's house. We're watching TV and suddenly my back went out exactly where his was. So I went into Swami Nitty Gritty and I said, I have this problem. He said, you got his thing by sympathizing. And Mm -hmm. uh, I kept that back. Even when he worked on me, it didn't help. What helped is two days later, my friend's condition came back and mine went away. So after that, even though I was going to a reflex science school, I was afraid to work on anybody until finally I learned a lot of techniques. And when I did a reflexology seminars, which I used to certify people for it, I would spend one hour of my workshop explaining how to shake off energy before I thought that was really cool to do that, but didn't take it seriously. But after that, I took all kinds of things seriously. Uh, You get rapport from heat. We say we're in heat when we're sexual. And also we have uh, heat is in relationship. So after you work on somebody, you put your hands in cold running water, And in one time in New York, when I worked on a very serious person, I ran down three steps of stairs and put my hands in the snow (laughs) to make sure. (laughs) So these are very real things. It sounds like woo-woo science, but we have energy overlaps and we're not the discrete people we think we are. (laughs) We, for instance, are printouts of our parents And people want to deny that, but we are actually printouts of them and go through both their desires they didn't want to do and the ones they did do. So when a parent says, oh, uh, look at those disgusting people, those hippies having sex there, then their kids are going to end up doing that because they're going to live out the things that they were afraid of. And it gets really complicated, but overlaps definitely exist wow I, and do you think showering helps because sometimes i feel like i don't yes. need it for my physical body but showering i just feel totally different negative ionization of a natural sort those generators can get you in trouble but showers fireplaces a walk at the beach uh, uh thunderstorms those things automatically make you feel better the positive ionization used to be called the phone for the phoenician the winds and the santa Ana winds we have here at the sundowners those make people feel depressed so automatically you can help your health and actually have a psychic self-defense by doing that. Also, the Romans, when they would have strategy uh, section uh, sessions, they would always have their arms straight out and their legs never cross. If you want to block energy, you actually by crossing fingers, that's why we call it, fingers crossed, you're immune, or you cross your arms. It's a very real, real deal. Psychic self, self-defense, uh, I, I met a man who taught it in Houston who was definitely a legitimate psychic. Uh, he's the one that diagnosed the jewelry. I'm, I'm sure I've told you that story before. And uh, these energy overlaps are actual. They're not fiction. Yeah, I, I know in, in arguments, people will tend to cross their arms, right, when they're having an argument. And sometimes we'll do it subconsciously if we just feel like we don't feel safe around a person. (laughs) It's subconscious. In fact, when I have a client that does that right away, I know they're they're really uh, opposed to certain things. Many people come to people uh, more like for uh, uh, to kiss the boo-boo. They don't really want to get well. Uh, Strangely enough, Gurdjieff said, and he was correct, it's harder for a person to give up their pain than their pleasure they'll give up their pain way before they give up their pleasure it's a strange thing some people say it's because 
we know we're going to die at the end, so we don't want to live, get too attached to living. So we keep a lot of pain in there so that when we go, oh, it's kind of a relief I'm leaving. Because if we feel too good, hey, I'm going to miss this too much. And there may be some truth by that. They, they, those are authors have come up with those uh, ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The that's Denial really- of Death. That's the book. And the Denial of Death, he goes into that topic extensively. Wow. Well, restricting uh, sugar makes life less uh, pleasurable, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Look at Warren Buffett. He claims to get 25% of his calories from high fructose corn syrup and Coca-Cola. Then he eats C's candy, peanut brittle, which is also a C's product, and he has desserts and stuff, along with his steak. Of course, he doesn't, he's not a vegetarian by any means, and he's 93. Hugh Hefner drank 30 Pepsis a day with sugar until he had a heart attack, which was not the sugar. They blamed the sugar. So then he started taking the uh, the artificial sweetener in the 30 Pepsis a day. And uh, he lived till 91. Now, maybe it was bunny power that kept him alive. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought up high fructose corn syrup because I forgot to ask you about this earlier. And I know Ray said that it was contaminated with starch. Like when you actually do the analysis, it was like, as to... much as 30%, he claims. Yeah. And it's not the same starch that you would find in like the cooked potatoes that you love, right? Like he was saying it's a different type of starch. Starch is very quite a bit. The uh, potato starch is larger. Rice is the smallest. And uh, I found an old book back in the day that had all the different starch sizes. And they're really remarkable. Now, there's something called presorption where you can actually get starch, particularly if it's uh, undercooked, that will go into your uh, capillaries and give you a heart attack. And that's a very real thing. The, the, the trouble is, it depends on the size of the starch. Uh, not only starch, do you know that some women have actually died when they've had sex and a sperm will get into the blood flow and block the heart and they have a heart attack. It's extremely rare. So people shouldn't be really worried about it, but the same, and the same with starts. It's uh, when people eat a lot of that many, I I don't know how many, but I, I would say many heart attacks are actually caused by eating raw to uh, or undercooked al dente uh, starch. And uh, all you need is to cook it thoroughly And if you add butter, you're clear and a little maybe a little dietary fiber, too. You're not going to have a problem. It's almost impossible. But now they're using beyond microparticles, which are what starch particles are. They're going to nanoparticles. And the medical police state is now going to give you drugs by persorption. (laughs) It's going to go. In, in your skin, into your capillaries directly and be circulating in your blood without having to go through the stomach and needles and things like that. In fact, they're going to use it for uh, vaccines and things of that nature as well. So, Wow. So do you think people buying sodas with high fructose corn syrup would be better off buying like Mexican Coca-Cola with the just I do. sucrose? I do, because I think they're still taking the chance. I don't think it's a big chance. Warren Buffett's still doing well. But but I, I think uh, the pure sugar is much more medicinal and healthier for you. Uh, so the Mexican Coke, yeah, compared to the stuff you get in the U.S., you have to be aware of some of the stuff that's Mexican Coke sold in the U.S., uh, like at uh, Smart and Final. That didn't taste the same and didn't agree with me. I used to buy Mexican Coke at a Middle Eastern store in Tucson and no, in Phoenix. And uh, that was delicious. And so I could tell the difference. I I bought a case of 48 and (laughs) drank it anyway. But I suspect that there was something else in that besides just uh, sugar. Interesting. Yeah. And I I know different years of production, like a, if the, the cap is uh, if it's is silver or white on the label, it'll say made with genetically modified ingredients, but one doesn't. 
it's really interesting. There's so many details just with that alone. Um, I, I was going to say, it's funny. I, I was watching a lecture by David Hawkins years ago and he was sitting there drinking a Coke. I think it was in plastics. So it was the high fructose corn syrup. And this was back when I was an extreme purist. And I remember just judging him and mm -hmm. thinking, oh, I can't believe anything he says because he's drinking this poison. <laughs> you know, but looking back, it's kind of funny. <laughs> I went for, uh, I think, about 20 years without drinking a single carbonated beverage of all because I was especially down on Coke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the, the carbon dioxide in Coke, too, can be beneficial, not in the way people think it is, because it's alkalizing, not acidifying. And uh, it's often used by people who have grief issues. They crave either alcohol or carbon dioxide. If they have issues of uh, not doing well, not keeping up with the Joneses, then they go for uh, sugars and, and milk products and things like that the one it rises up and works on the pyloric no excuse me the uh the uh, cardiac valve at the bottom of the uh, uh esophagus and then you get in trouble over grief issues with that and it can actually cause a heart attack it's really rare though and then on the pyloric valve that's like status issues that people have and then it closes that valve up so it's really wow. interesting how our emotions have a hierarchy of levels, almost like chakras. Interesting. Yeah, it's funny. I was going down the rabbit hole with uh, the Coca-Cola thing a few years ago, and I found in India, I mean, they're all over YouTube, just search phosphoric acid, and these Indian doctors have been using that for years for different conditions, just phosphor, which you think is, doesn't it clean rust off metal bins and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting yeah it's uh, but what you said about alkalizing i just what, thought about phosphoric acid because you have an acid but then the co2 is alkalizing so it's kind of like a neutral beverage maybe mm, but it's a carbon dioxide that gets the problem but it does <laughs> cause more neutrality uh, you know great pete was really against phosphoric acid too but he said you get it mostly from muscle meat that's why he recommended organ meat and you also get it from grains so he was against both. And and I think people eat too much. I think you can eat a certain amount, but but definitely in our society, we don't eat organ meat like they do in other places. Oh, but the same thing with fish. If you ate the head of fish and the eyeballs and everything else, you're going to have no problem with the salmon. But how, who does that? They eat the muscle meat where all the omega-3 is and not the counter action because obviously a fish is going to have their own counter reactions for things. Now, fish eyes are my I had a former girlfriend. Her kid loved fish eyes, ate them like that. She be ever all the time. Raw fish eyes. Yum, 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 yum. Wow. Until he found out those are really fish eyes. I had the same thing. I used to love tongue, cow tongue. Until one day I asked my parents, this isn't a real cow tongue, is it? Well, what do you think it is? Wow. <laughs> that was my last cow tongue. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty freaky <laughs> it shows how um, persnickety we can get <laughs> yeah yeah well it, this is actually a good segue because uh for the question and answer the questions that listeners sent in all right one of, the, one of the parts of the conversation that i think about with with uh not only just refined sugar intake but just carbohydrate intake in general uh is protein and i i think uh, it's kind of extreme how I see it. You either have the carnivores where it's like more the better, you know, like work out daily and eat a lot of protein always. But then you have the raw vegans that are like zero protein. Um, and I know you have a, a certain perspective on it. And, and there is that relationship, I believe, with protein intake and sugar where protein kind of balances out the the effect. Yes, it, it does. In fact, Warren Buffett, for all that sugar, he eats a steak. And he also eats at Burger King. No, at uh, McDonald's, too. But but he eats protein, too. So uh, now we are omnivores. We can eat remarkable things. I've told you before about Mr. Eats All, who ate a Cessna. It took him two years, shopping carts, all kinds of things. Bananas made him ill. I think eggs made him ill, too. 
Um, he, uh, other people like William Bankier, the Scottish Apollo, he was a total vegetarian and probably the strongest man ever to come down the pike. He could be on a pole and lift an elephant off the ground with his leg strength and with a rider on it. And I don't think anyone's ever uh, duplicated that. Gypsy Boots was really close. He may have even been a vegetarian. I'm not sure. But he would sleep on a bed of nails. And I've seen him do phenomenal stunts in person that he could, that other people couldn't do. Uh, I've seen him throw a football for a, a block down and then turn around and show the TV cameras his abs and say, eat your heart out, Joe Namath. <laughs> <Name it. laughs> and... Uh, and uh, so, but at the same time, other people like uh, are, are total meat eaters that swear you have to have meat. Uh, Sergio Olivia, he says it's crazy to be a vegetarian in bodybuilding. But look at Bill Pearl, he did it for years and was one of the strongest men. Uh, Andreas Colleen did it for a long time too. And so we can do it. The, the reason I prefer a eating lower on the food chain. If you look at veget people who eat lower, not completely low, they tend to live longer. And if you look at the animal world, how long does a lion live? Even in captivity, when they think they 21 or so, horses can and cows can go up to 40 to 50 and elephants to 70 or 80. You'll find that the only animal that eats meat that lives really long is the crocodile because they master birth, uh, breath control. Some of them, if the water is a certain temperature, can hold their breath for half a day. That's wow. remarkable. Normally, it's like an hour or so. But when you have breath control like that, then it doesn't really matter that much what you eat, <laughs> even fasting. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. It makes, and it, it seems one of the, like one of those things, I don't know if it's uh, the blood type, you know, they talk about O negative and stuff. O blood type needs more meat, but it seems like it's totally possible for people to be vegetarian. I don't know about vegan. Maybe I guess there's like outliers, but vegetarian, I think absolutely. It's, it's, it's possible for certain types of people and then carnivore, certain types of people, right? It probably just kind of depends on, a lot of things at, at one uh, point in time uh most people on earth were a vegetarian because they lived in the tropics and the temperate area now obviously you're not going to make a become a vegetarian up in the arctic or antarctica and the same shows in evolution the panda bear is in the tropics and they eat they eat all day because all they eat is bamboo Meanwhile, the polar bear is a total 100% uh, mostly, maybe 99% meat eater because that's all they have up there. Now, grizzly bears and brown bears, brown bears and black bears actually surprisingly eat very low on the food chain. They only uh, eat a human if they're hungry or uh, an animal. And when they come out of hibernation, they're basically like a vulture. They eat dead animals that are frozen. I get this frozen meals waiting for them as soon as they come out of hibernation. Then they go down and eat the sedges and grasses and things like that. So many bears are as much as 80% uh, vegetarian. And that surprises a lot of people. And they have teeth closest to human beings, according to uh, a park ranger told me that one time, uh, than any other animal. Whether that's wow. true or not, they, they definitely have a lot of similarities with uh, with human anatomy, except I believe they don't have a gallbladder or whatever. Wow. Yeah, living up here, bears are fascinating to me. And I've, I've uh, only seen a, a, a it, was a, it wasn't a grizzly, but it was like a brown bear uh, nearby. But I know during berry picking season, you have to watch out because they'll be foraging with you. <laughs> and if you're quiet, you know, you can look around the bush and you'll see a, a bear. Right there. <laughs> so a lot of people carry bells on them and different things, you know. But. Yeah. When I've been up there, I've seen them. Definitely. We, <laughs> we, we would drive up to my friend's place. It was like 25 miles of dirt road. And you're going to see some bears along the way. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Um, this is a good question. Are you a fan of eating ripe fruit only? 
uh, there's, and then uh, she said there's more sugar, but less vitamin C, the riper it gets. Yes, I am. A, the, <laughs> the riper it is, the more sugarized it is, and the healthier it is for you and the less starch in it. And uh, the vitamin C, you'll still get a good dose out of that. It, but some vitamin C does start to break down. It breaks down into oxalic acid, which contrary to popular uh, notions, is not that bad for you. Now, if you eat raw rhubarb and stuff like that, you're cruising for a bruising. But, but if you eat a moderate amount, uh, this whole fear factor over oxalic acid is mostly ridiculous. Like, don't eat beets because it has oxalic acid. Don't eat kale because it has oxalic acid. Uh, not true, <laughs> especially if you eat sugar with it. <laughs> yeah, because does the body have mechanisms to get rid of? Because uh, usually the oxalate will bind to different minerals, like namely calcium. I think right to make calcium oxalate crystals or stones, but the body can get rid of those. You know, people take uh, things like uh, bentonite to do that very thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly what oxalate. Why take bentonite where you can take oxalate? It does the same type of thing. Sometimes uh, those toxic chemicals, as well as getting too much iron and things like that, are bound up in oxalate. And so oxalate actually, the, the reason, uh, anyway, it's curative. It can be curative. Mm. It, like anything else, you can get too much of a poison. Yeah. You know, uh, you need a certain amount of toxins. Hahnemann's idea of uh, homeopathy was based on a poison to cure a poison, a thief to catch a thief. And in fact, a lot of people think you have to take a homeopathic medicine. But he would quote way back in 1805 or 10 when he, the first edition of his book came out, uh, what we would call almost vaccinations today. Uh, if a chef burned themselves you could put it in ice and then it would take maybe two months to heal a serious burn. But if when you got burned, you stuck your hand really quickly back in the hot water, boiling water and pulled it out immediately, sometimes it would take a day. So he quoted wow. things like that from other physicians and everything. His original book, a lot of homeopathists have not read, and I recommend it's on the Internet. Hahnemann's original book, or even its 10th or 12th edition, pretty much has uh, not changed dramatically, and get an idea what homeopathy really is and why we need a certain amount of uh, toxins in us to, to, to our immunity to know what it's doing. That's why a child will often put Christmas bulbs in their mouth, anything. They just put anything in their mouth. My mother found me with half a, helic, a, a, half a caterpillar in my mouth. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> kids are going to do that to challenge their immunity and find out what works. You don't want to get extreme. A parent should monitor but not be upset when they eat mud pies and things like that. <laughs> yeah. I saw a grown man that did it for, for clicks on uh... – a reel or something eating an earthworm live. <laughs> but I think though that they were used those in Chinese medicine, right? The earthworms. They do. Things. They yeah. uh, eat a lot of insects. Uh, then now they say that the uh, chitin is poisonous, but actually people have been eating insects for uh, centuries and centuries. I don't want to do it, but <laughs> <laughs> you're not going the less, uh, what's it? The Schwab route. The <laughs> Yep. That's what he wants us to do. Eat bugs. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're eating caviar and lobster <laughs> and all kinds of things. So. I think he posted this. Uh, maybe you posted Zuckerberg. He was eating a steak, right? Yep. Uh, yeah. He's in the cattle business now, which, you know, and by the way, I want to say something about Zuckerberg. I think he's more of a minor uh, victim of all that's going on, even though he's a billionaire. He's making a fortune. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with Pony Ma? Mm -mm. Pony Ma has the biggest, uh, the app that rules them all in China. Pony Ma basically has what Elon Musk wants to do, an app that does everything. But of course, okay. the Chinese government can know everything you're doing and block any message you do. But you can get movies, everything. Elon Musk wants to make that into X. When the COVID first came out, uh, Mark Zuckerberg had uh, reservations about it. 
he was advising his uh, employees, be careful with this. And I think more or less, they make him wear a monkey suit when he comes to testify for stuff that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And he's got, he's doing like Podima does. If, if he says something against the Chinese government, he's just an entrepreneur. Guess what? He's gone. He disappears. (laughs) And Mark Zuckerberg's in the same thing. So, I applaud him for the things he does. I, I'm not a big fan of AI taking over our lives. But now he's got a, uh, I forget how many acres he has, a thousand acres, something like that in Hawaii. And he's growing Wagyu beef and feeding it macadamia nuts and something else. Wagyu is a famous a beer, I think they take too. Uh, it's a famous beef. Uh, in Japan, my friend is Japanese, and he can tell you all about it, Elegant Yamamoto, and uh, and it's been done for years. So give him credit where credit is due. The guy who's, who popularized the uh, multimillionaire, billionaire, Melaleuca, he has a ranch right next to Zuckerberg. So I give him credit for what he does do, and he's under pressure from the government to, if he says stuff that it doesn't censor people on Facebook. They're going to put him out of business because just like they did with Pony Ma, the Chinese government said, anyone who says something negative on uh, on WeChat, you're re- legally responsible. And that's what they've done to Zuckerberg. Mm-hmm. So I don't think he's totally innocent and he's... Uh, He could be a martyr and say, I'm not doing this anymore. But when you get a lot of money, it's hard to do. So I give him a pass on a lot of things. And I like the fact he doesn't wear a monkey suit with the tie and all of that (laughs) stuff. That's one thing I I realized that basically if I can wear a tie and starch it at a 45 degree angle, then I'll wear the tie. But they're saying, (laughs) keep your dick down. Excuse my language. But that's what they're doing with the tie or a bow tie. It's tighter than not. That's like a noose too, right? It's It's like a noose to me. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, and who's in control of the world in China? They don't wear Mao suits. They wear ties. It's suspicious. Mm -hmm. Rockefeller Mm -hmm. has been in China since 1921 when they put in their first college and uh, in Russia. They don't wear uh, Cossack uniforms. They wear an American tie. India is the only one where they wear a non-tie and maybe some little countries I don't know about. But uh, the the whole Davos thing comes out of Harvard and out of Boston. And even, well, I won't go into other things to get you in trouble. So I'm stopping (laughs) right here. (laughs) Let's say. I like like your perspective on these, these, they're really just actors, right, on the world stage because when I go on social media, I see so many knee-jerk emotional reactions. I mean, especially with like the Apple Vision Pro that's out now. I'm not for it or against it, but when these things come out, whether it's a new technology, Neuralink, whatever, or these people, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk say something, we're like, oh, he's a Zionist, he's a globalist, he's. Uh, you we have no idea, right? So I like your perspective of just keeping an open mind. You know, they're probably both. They're probably good and bad at the same time. <laughs> you know, because of uh, mass formation uh, psychosis, whatever you want to call it, uh, if Zuckerberg was gone, there'd be a hundred, a thousand people to replace him immediately. Mm-hmm. So we tend yeah. to demonize a person when a lot of people would get in that same situation, would be doing the exact same thing. And so to me, I, I have lost friends on Facebook by doing the pro- telling the process th- uh, the, the following thing. When they started having bank laws where you couldn't go in and uh, like if I went into my bank and, and wanted to cash a check, from another bank, uh, no, from their bank, I would. they would ask for my account number. They didn't before. And I said, I'm not giving it to you. I said, well, then you're going, we're going to have to fingerprint you. I said, do it. But then what I did is I showed up just before closing time. So they'd have to stay 10 or 15 minutes after and I'd stall around and everything to bug them. Well, people said, you can't. You're up. That's that person's innocent. No, they're working for a, uh, a a bank president that I can't get to. 
So I'm going to get to them so they complain to the bank president. It's like, it's insane. Suppose uh, the, the Nazis sent troops to kill me. I'm going to let them kill me because they didn't give the order. I'm going to shoot the troops. And the people in banks are the troops. Well, I've had people defriending me for saying that I've, I'm picking on innocent people. They're wow. not innocent. They're working for the man. That's a good point. <laughs> anyway, that's fun... my point. They don't like me uh, defending Zuckerberg either. I got yeah. defended for that. I said, then what are you doing on Facebook? <laughs> yeah, people get offended by every little th- I mean, if you have an opinion, you're going to get into a debate or people are going to try to pull you into a debate, which is a waste of time. Uh, people always want me to debate on the podcast if I disagree with a little thing that my guest says. It's like it, it'll go nowhere. It's just a total waste of breath <laughs> yeah i welcome people who disagree with me on facebook i i, I only defriend it when they say you're a bleep 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 and a bleep 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 and a bleep 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 and a bleep and they keep saying it then then they're gone <laughs> but otherwise i have people who totally disagree with things i say and and they make good points you know it, it's good to to have your ideas challenged so you have a lot of people ask me really good questions that i have to Think, think about it myself. Wow, I hadn't mm-hmm. thought about that. I better research that. <laughs> yeah, this is a fun one. How old is Adam chronologically? I'm 83 <laughs> revolutions around the sun. <laughs> I was born wow. before the Second World War started. <laughs> wow. And I want to I want positive, positively hypnotize you with the dementia comment. You don't have dementia and you have perfect fatty acid balance <laughs> and your mind is sharp and... Uh, I think that's just a fact. So there's that. Just you to know, say. <laughs> all in all, I, I'm doing pretty well compared to uh, – recently I went back and uh, I have a friend that's a mas- massage therapist, and she said, your body is not one of uh, anyone – at that time I think it was 78 or something like that. Your body just – isn't the same it's uh it's a, a lot younger than you're supposed to be are you sure you're that old <laughs> yeah That's so awesome. i've been really flexible and part of it i've done sufi dancing and a lot of yoga and things and free form dancing can actually keep your muscles from getting in habitual forms that lock you in so i've done a lot of free form dancing in my time i mean lots hours and hours and hours of it four hours at a time Wow. Are there are there other things that have the same effect like that or that you can do besides freeform dancing, like uh, walking or anything? <laughs> yes, actually, uh, I first got the concept from Gurdjieff, who said by the time a person's 19 or 20 years old, they only have eight or nine body movements that they that they use. And I found that fascinating. And I had a Sufi teacher named Adnan Sarhan who could read minds. So he knew I knew that. So he said, I am going to beat my drum and you do a different move every time. Well, I watched people and realized the faster he got, they got down to four movements or five movements. So I went out there, threw myself on the floor, did everything different. But I realized I was trapped in it, too. So I became fascinated with the concept. On studying with Adnan further, he said, okay, now you're going to dance like you're a kite in the wind. And you're just free form. Every little gust goes this way. And then he gave another example. You're out in the ocean and the waves are coming in and you're moving into each ocean. So like surfing, you've got to go with the flow and being uh, in swimming in the waves, you have to be with the flow. And freeform dancing, you attempt to do a different movement every time and move this wrist, uh, the wrist uh, joint, the uh, elbow joint, the shoulder joint. That was Yogananda's idea, too. People who do routine yoga and do the same positions over and over lock themselves into prescribed body movements. So they should do some kind of freeform movements or some kind of more flexible yoga to actually uh, get that freeform thing in. And they'll live a lot longer. It actually wow. has helped me. Yeah, swimming makes sense. Even if it's uh, like a lake or something like that, that would still have a similar effect probably. Particularly if you're doing free form things or, or change your pace. Just like if you run, 
a runner, if you see them, they, they look like this. You know, like they're in pain, <laughs> and they have the same pace. If you change your speed a little, change your, uh, mm -hmm. your stride, how long you go. And if you particularly, I solved the problem by running up rocky trails and jumping over rock, rock oh. jumping. As, as a kid, I looked to do that. We had a, a, a stream. It was a big stream. Back in New Jersey, you had big streams. Here in California, they called it a river if it's that size. <laughs> and I would love to run over the rocks as far as I could. And when I was in La Jolla, they had all the rocks along the shoreline there. I would do that more carefully because I wasn't as agile as I was when I was a uh, preschooler. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because we just went through like negative... 15, 20 Fahrenheit weather for several weeks and, you know, snow on the ground. And it's such a mild winter now. It's almost like an El Nino winter. I think we're already heading into, into spring, but I noticed, yeah, my body is a little tighter. Just I'm still outside and doing stuff, but less like hiking and uh, definitely feel a difference. Makes a difference. And you'll notice I'm dressed like an Eskimo here today because we don't have heat here. So so it's like uh, 45 degrees or so in here at any time. And particularly during the day, now the sun is out today. So we're going to get the greenhouse effect in here and that lasts through the night. But we've had a uh, pineapple express, an atmospheric river, whatever you call it, rain bombs hit here. Uh, we got... The, we had an emergency around us, but we were pretty well protected this time again. And L.A. had 80 tons of raw sewage break loose and flow all the way over to Cabrillo Beach. Wow. Yeah, I saw the news down there. I had my friends that were making fun of it because they said, oh, they're always hyping up the storm and stuff. And that's what they were doing, making it sound like it was going to be a mega storm down in Southern California. 380 or so landslides and Hollywood Hills wow. really got hit and over a million people out of, uh, out of, uh, uh, power. We wow. were lucky. We didn't, I, I told you before we had like four power outages and all this stuff. We didn't have a single power outage, knock on wood, just to make sure it doesn't happen again. And, uh, and basically it was easy for us. So while people were calling us up and saying, Are you okay? <laughs> or emailing us and wow. they're on Facebook. And yeah, we, uh, we had one slide about two miles away and we have an alternate way of getting to the farmer's market. We don't have to go off over Ortega Hill road. <laughs> yeah. Part, part of the land up here. I just discovered yesterday, I was out there for hours. There is a, a strong head pressure and a drop from a, from a, I think it was runoff, but like a seasonal Creek type thing. Mm -hmm. And so I went through a, I went down a rabbit hole of micro hydro uh, electric generation, you know, the little turbines and there's so many designs that it, it gets so complicated. I was watching like a million different designs that people have made, you know, cause the old water wheels are like the original ones, but now they have, I don't know, hundreds of different types to get 24 seven electricity out of, you know, if it's a 15 foot drop, I think is ideal, a certain head pressure. So I've been looking into that. I, I like that as much as the, the health stuff, the, the uh, off grid power generation. Cause I think that's being suppressed. I mean, even the wind, solar, micro hydro, that's all like archaic technology i believe right <laughs> you know i believe so too that they're hiding the technology california alone by just doing what bermuda does they don't have any rivers they don't have any springs they they have to have special roofs that that collect the little rain they get and they survive fine california misses two things number one you could have a fog net that gets all the fog you do like they do in Chile. And also, you can actually drill a hole and make a giant swamp cooler and get 40 million billion gallons of water go over California 40 times a year. You, wow. they, don't, they don't rain, what do you call it? Uh, making rain by generating it does not work. But... The humidity is there. It's in the air. You can get it in the Sahara Desert. You can get it in the Goba, uh, the Gobi Desert. 
uh, John Nordberg writes about it extensively. Nobody wants to listen to him because there's no money in it. You know, anybody wow. can do it, but yourself make a big uh, swamp cooler and it can be done in the deserts. It can redo the Sahara desert. Meanwhile, there's primary water. There is eight times more water in the center of the earth than there is in the entire oceans of the world and the water and the air atmosphere of the water eight times science admits it a guy named uh reese uh his, his first name now escapes me but he drilled wells and they're the the third largest by land area city in california is california city but no one lives there but there's plenty of water there. There wasn't until he drilled and got primary water. Uh, Where the primary water comes up is not from the aquifers and the valleys. It comes at the top of the mountains. And Reese drilled, I forget, 800 wells like that. And it was well known. But they don't want primary water. They want to have a water shortage so they can charge you for it. They want to have a gasoline shortage. They want to have all these shortages They're just false. It's all lies. Electrical shortages. They can generate that. In 1951, uh, uh, they had the ability to convert the entire world to 80% of the world in one year at MIT. You can Mm -hmm. find it in Reader's Mm -hmm. Digest. What happened that we lost the technology? We can send a cat 20 million miles into space now. You know, they have a cat out there i don't know what's going to happen to the poor cat but they can do that but they can't make a solar uh mirror uh when i was in bellingham washington i took mirrors and i just aimed them and we sat and and were very warm without a heater sitting in my fifth wife and i uh, drinking our cobalam and sonic in the morning and and bathing in the sun by just putting a mirror down there and reflecting it in the upstairs window yeah (laughs) when i was down there in southern california it's like i forget how many days of sun that you you get down there but it's it's like a hundred plus what we get here in idaho and you know Solar down there makes so much sense because almost every day you can generate power up here. It makes sense in the summer, but I think hydro makes more sense up here year round because even when, you know, the top of the stream's frozen, you could still generate power underneath because the water won't freeze if it's flowing, right? Yeah. An amazing thing about solar power is brightness is what counts, not temperature, because you can have the most efficient solar power is in outer space. And there is, it's obviously very cold (laughs) during the night in outer space, but it works fine. Now, when I went to Michigan in 1980, the first time, I was amazed to see all the solar power. I said, you're running on solar power? Yeah. And it's not delivered to you. You put it in your home, the power company sells it to you. They already had two nuclear plants. And they voted on it and said, you're not going to have any power if you do this. And they said, we don't care. And so then they went to solar power. So I saw solar power everywhere. And I even stayed in a guy who told me, I'm a hippie. I'm too dumb to work for anybody else. So I build houses. So he built houses under the ground and didn't even need a heat. He put the window toward the south. And he had a, uh, a greenhouse in between where all his plants and gardening was. And then he parked his car on top of his house. And he lived there without having, to have, having been a heater. Wow. I looked so, into that. It just seems so dark when you get further in. <laughs> yeah. So, so there are disadvantages. That I'd rather have light even during the winter. But there are so many ways to, to heat uh, that they don't want people to know. Here in California, you may know about this. They, they basically uh, bait and switch people in to put solar in, and they were going to get all this feedback money. Uh, but once you sell to the grid, you're the prisoner. They took those benefits away, give you a minor uh, a minor benefit if you got it in time and you sign all this stuff mm-hmm. away. And so they're getting screwed because the the local, the big company, SCE, wants to deliver it so they can make money. They don't want you off the grid. 
Yeah. And of course, off the grid is independent. Otherwise, you're there in business and wasting that electricity by transporting it. Everybody who knows about electricity, I work for the phone company even, you, the longer your line is away, the less reception, the more electricity is lost in the wires. And uh, same here. So they're dipping people. It could be so much easier. I, I've met people who, uh, like uh, Hutchinson, you've heard of the Hutchinson mm-hmm. effect? That guy was real. I, he mm-hmm. was a client of mine and actually took a solar nutrition class. And I met him when he was on the lamb from the Chinese, from the Canadian government. They said he was a kook until Germany was going to buy his anti gravity machine. And so was Japan. And so they put, they, they confiscated his lab put a warrant out for his arrest. And when I met him, he was in a Bellingham Indian reservation hiding out. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Great it's, guy. That, I've had so many dreams where I'm in like an anti-gravity craft on earth and I'm taken off into space. And um, I, that's the main reason why I want to live a long time to experience that and <laughs> be able to go anywhere. And um, yeah, I think it's being suppressed. I think that Stephen Greer's whole thing talking about disclosure and all these crashes. I was we were watching a thing about Roswell last night and the the bodies that were recovered. I think they were doing an autopsy in the field of one of them. And I feel like we've around right around World War II, or right after World War II, that's when a lot of interesting craft and alien stuff started happening a lot more. You know, Hutchinson is the real deal. He had an anti gravity machine, but now. If you look at his videos, they look quaint because they won't give him any money. He he uses right. junk to, to to raise bowling balls off the off the floor yeah. and things like that. If they gave him money and we gave other zero uh, energy people money, <laughs> we could have all the energy we want. But that's not the plan <laughs> right. of world governance. Yeah, yeah, we have to pay for electricity, pay for gas, pay for diesel, propane. I mean, it just keeps adding up. It's that's it. <laughs> when actually, so it could be a lot cheaper. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um. So we had a question here: thoughts on a vegetarian diet with lots of dairy, eggs, and broth. I guess they're meaning bone broth. I learned from Swami Nitty Gritty, and I think it's true that dairy should be restricted to the fatty parts of it as much as possible. So ghee, pure butter, whole cream. And as a dairy man, I noticed that when people would go on vacation, we could leave cream on the doorstep, but never non-fat milk or low-fat milk because it spoiled. And so there is actually, Ray Pete seemed to have missed the mess, the, the memo on this that, uh, Drinking low-fat milk uh, keeps you thin. Well, I've drank quarts of cream and couldn't gain any weight because I drank it on time. And uh, a lot of it is mythology. But I think uh, cream is no problem. Eggs are no problem. Uh, What's his name? Vince Gironda, 36 eggs a day. He had my friend Don Peters, a bodybuilder, on 36 eggs a day, too. 36 whole eggs. He said, don't dishonor the chicken by just eating the uh, the white of the egg. Eat the whole thing. And they were tested. He got the idea from scientists who were working on people who had severe burn injuries. They gave them 36 eggs a day. So Vince Gironda says, if it'll heal bone energies, what will it do for testosterone? Well, it raised testosterone like Dianaval did without raising cholesterol a bit. He had a doctor working with him that analyzed the people that were taking it, probably including my friend Don. I never asked him personally, but... uh, but uh, so you can eat plenty of eggs if you want to. We eat two a day at night for solar nutrition. It drops out of the bottom of the chicken. You can think of it that way. And, uh, and we'd eat any fish we eat would be at that time of day too. And, uh, and otherwise dairy, uh, butter, we eat lots of raw butter. Uh, we have it on just about everything, midday and nighttime particularly. Our potatoes for sure, and uh, midday with our uh, with our we cook uh, like mung bean sprouts, and uh, 
We sometimes eat lentils, things like that, mm. but lots of butter mm. and yeah. cheese. We eat cheese too. Cheddar cheese oh. particularly is good for your, is actually very good for your teeth, for instance. I got the yeah. memo on that one too late. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting when you brought up Ray at, at repeat and milk, because I've heard him say people that are hypothyroid, uh, milk, was it milk, salt, and gelatin? Or three of the best things that they could consume, uh, that that kind of bring him up to speed. And uh, he was a huge fan of gelatin. Um, what what were your, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think it can be good. I think we make our own gelatin in the body, from what I've seen. So we can p- put it together ourselves. Now, some people might have metabolic defects like that, and it could really help to take gelatin, even from plain Jello. You know, yeah. so. Uh, <laughs> So I'm certainly not against it. We haven't bothered to do it because we're able to make our our gelatin okay. And the sugar worked for me. I was having something in 2015. I was dying. I had edema. I had purpura. Are you familiar with purpura? You suddenly Mm -hmm. get a bruise on your body and you didn't hit anything. It just internally broke open. And so I was getting these bruises since the 90s. And... I, it can be liver failure. I think it's more dangerous for a male than a woman, they said. I thought I was on the way out in the 90s, even when I started getting the small one, petechia. And then they got larger and larger, and I was getting them more often every month. And basically, my circulatory system was breaking down. My teeth were bleeding if I touched them, uh, the gums. My ass was bleeding if I rubbed it. And as soon as I got off tuna and everything, did the oranges and did sugar. It all went away. I haven't had a purpura since 2015 while I was having him from the 90s. I, I can rub my butt with sandpaper now and not have it bleed. And I can I push oranges against my teeth. No blood. No blood wow. whatsoever. Well, before, touch an orange, it'd be red, bright red. Wow. I That's forgot to bad. I forgot to ask you about orange juice. I just started adding it back in because we when we can get good oranges, fresh squeezed, I you know, I can't do the store bought, even the cold pressed or whatever. I always like fresh squeezed, but you're a huge fan of orange juice for medicinal big, reasons. Big fan. And now it, for some reason at the farmer's market, both our sources are out of oranges, but BD is our favorite source. He's got tangerines. So uh, Donald Lay mentioned tangerines are even better than oranges. So we're not having any problem. We just switched to tangerines and I prefer to juice mine. Uh, a vibrant gal just eats hers by breaking them apart and eating them. I like to juice them. They're very, they're easier to juice than oranges with one of those glass juicers, you know, you, yeah. you use your hand on. And yeah. anyway, we, we, it's an essential part of our diet. And I think that's one of the main reasons that uh, I got rid of purpura, bleeding gums, bleeding this, uh, edema. I haven't had edema since 2015 last case my both ankles and my one ankle was always slightly larger than the other gone also got rid of some uh spider veins and uh some of my uh worst uh uh uh, varicose veins because i was breaking down at one point everything was uh just going south why not ray talk Ray talked a lot about the flavonoids like the apigen and narogen and there's even one in orange peel that's never talked about um, can't remember the name of that one, but uh, which I think you can get in marmalade. But do you think it's the orange color alone too? I mean, there's potassium. There's so many things in orange juice, right? I think those bioflavonoids exist, and also a very strange thing. Swami Nitty said it was the riboflavin, and I corrected him. I said, "You mean bioflavonoids? No, I mean riboflavin." Well, when I researched it, I found out that riboflavin, the yellow vitamin, actually is uh, one of the most heat uh, resistant of all B vitamins. So I have not found any research on that, but he swore it's not bioflavonoids, it's riboflavin. So who knows? (laughs) But anyway, whatever it is, orange juice and orange work for me. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Yeah, because when I think about it, I mean, we don't really consume unless it's like orange bell peppers. You know, you always say you always hear, I mean, especially when I was raw vegan, it's like eat the rainbow. But when I think about orange, 
there's not many options. <laughs> yeah, carotenoids too. When you think of it, the beta carotene, all of those, they tend to be in the orange range. Some of them in the red range, like the one that makes flamingos red and things of that nature. If a flamingo doesn't eat uh, certain seafood that is rich in uh, carotenoids, they're white. They don't turn into pink flamingos. <laughs> Well, yeah, earlier when you were talking about retinol and beta carotene and that relationship and, and baby vegetables and plants, I can't remember exactly what it was, but the when, you know, if you if you pick a leafy green and you leave it out, it'll start to turn like yellow. And that's the pigment that was there that was hidden behind the green, but it's exposing itself as yellow. And I believe that was related to the beta carotene or vitamin A. Well, same thing with uh, when you see the green, the the further you go up the color scale, the less permanent the pigment is. Red is the most stable. It's even stop signs are in it. Orange is next. Yellow is next. Green is getting really, uh, it doesn't last that long. If you grow oranges in the tropics, they're green when they're ripe because the coolness doesn't destroy the, uh, the green and make it orange. Just like maple leaves during the winter, you get some cold, those green leaves, the green is all gone. And now you get reds and yellows and orange, like in upstate New York, you get all the, the maple trees. Same thing with pigments. Now, the rarest of all is blue. Most things that we see as blue is actually reflective. There is no pigment in a blue jay. If you take a blue jay feather and hit it with a hammer, it turns black because all the refraction is gone out of it. There's no blue bird. There's no blue jay. And there's no blue sky. There is no paint up in that blue sky, I guarantee. Blue, actually, the color raises up into the sky. The blue is way up there. The green is here. And then you keep going down to the browns and the reds. So actually permanence is in the carotenoids and the red, even in the oil companies, all the green is gone by the time they get down there, but there's lots of carotenoids in the oil. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> uh, this is a good one. How do women consume sugar without affecting their pH levels? Uh, it doesn't really affect their pH level. What controls the pH level is sterols versus fatty acids. If you take fatty acids, you tend to alkalize the body. If you take uh, sterols like cholesterol or the various plant sterols, you acidify the body. They are the major control of pH, not minerals like the, uh, the uh, macrobiotics people say. They have a small incidence, but without the fatty acids versus the uh, others, you don't have it. And the monounsaturated, they control it. So uh, you're always going to have some fatty acids. But if you want to make toxic fatty acids uh, and be alkaline, get radiation treatment. You'll be instantly alkaline. Get surgery. You'll be instantly alkaline. Uh, sugar has very little to do with pH value. Uh, in fact, in India, what do they do? Blame all the sugar they eat and the, and the goodies on uh, diabetes. But what do they do? When, when the crisis was going on with the war in Ukraine, they weren't going to get food from Ukraine. It was a major wheat belt. What was the main food they mentioned? Cooking oils, omega-6 wow. cooking oils. Ukraine is the highest uh, source of GMO cooking oils in the world. <laughs> really? wow. Yeah, they don't tell you that. That's what they're selling. Their GMO, it's called high oleo, which is <laughs> BS for low linolenic. <laughs> wow. Low omega-3s is what they're selling. No no wonder the u.s is sending so much support to them right because they're defending the right the oils <laughs> india depends more on their uh their cooking oils than they do their oil that's a humorous wow. thing and wow. again it's misleading they they blame well india eats all these sweets you know uh, yeah. and it's really the cooking oils and they almost indian people almost cannot 
cook without oils. I'm sure there's exceptions to the rules. I don't want to insult any Indian person to this, but a lot of them, they just use oils at the yin yang and always the uh, the corn oils and the, the, the DMO oils and the uh, the ones with omega sixes and omega threes in them. Well, omega sixes will never cause yellow fat disease, but they will cause cancer. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> omega threes can actually prevent cancer. <laughs> That's a weird thing there sometimes. By omega threes generate old age. Not a good idea. Uh, omega sixes generate cancer. So either way, you get screwed with with the omega sixes or threes. Interesting. You you maybe have a flashback when I used to go to the shopping mall with my friends, and we would get a uh, orange chicken. And I remember uh, this was down in San Diego, like Mission Valley or Fashion Valley Mall or something. And they they would take before they would throw the chicken on the giant cooking surface that you could see through the window. They would just spray almost like a gun crazy amount of oil i mean it must have been from my memory like 10 tablespoons or 15 <laughs> and just cover the plate in oil and then throw the chicken and vegetables on and i mean it was probably canola and i was raised on that stuff and that was part of what led me to ray pete and then finding his information on vitamin e and all this stuff i was like wow it all makes sense um but you mentioned diabetes and someone asked your thoughts on diabetes they said specifically type one, but just in general, because we talked about sugar a lot, but I, I did forget to ask you because people probably go to, doesn't sugar cause diabetes? You know, it's an interesting thing, but it's the estrogen and omega-3s and maybe nitric acid are the major causes of diabetes. Uh, in fact, it's censored, but William Budd realized that where's the sugar in the urine coming from? from protein breaking down. So he decided he was going to give, he was going to measure the sugar coming out and putting the sugar back in. And that way they wouldn't be eating their muscles up. So he gave at an average uh, eight ounces. No, no, it was more. I think it was 12 ounces of sugar per day plus four ounces of honey. And he kept people alive. They didn't have diabetes, diabetes drugs back then. Type 1 diabetes, he at least kept them alive. Now, it was like when you go for uh, like uh, failing kidneys, you go for regular treatments. So these people, to keep alive, they had to keep on eating all this sugar. But it kept them from dying because back then, type 1 was a death sentence. I mean, as soon as you were diagnosed, you were, you were out. You were checking out. A French man named uh, Poiré or something like that, he did the same thing. They didn't know each other at the same time. And if you look at Wikipedia, they say he was a good doctor, but he was a kook because he recommended taking sugar for diabetes. <laughs> well, they didn't say that he was successful. <laughs> they were saving people's lives. And now they don't want you to know that because sugar is a demon and a devil from hell. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's one of the most fascinating things that i ever read from ray pete's work was that when he talked about william budd in that one article that blew william my mind budd. and i looked right. him up in the original books it's, mm -hmm. it's back there in the original books because when i read yeah. someone i don't want to say well ray pete said it i mm -hmm. want to find out if he's really got the quote and every almost everything i've checked out 99 percent of ray pete it's there <laughs> i did yeah i bought the it was like over a hundred to two hundred bucks on Amazon, and I bought the original uh, writings, and then I found that section. It was just a small section in that huge book. And you're right, I I don't do that with everything because it would cost a lot of money. But as much as I can, I try to find the. I think they call it primary sources, right? Yeah, uh, I've been lucky. I've been I I figured out how to get around Google's back doors. One time, they 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 closed uh, one of their back doors because of people like me. I found out that, you know, you can get in some bo Google books a lot of stuff and some you can can only get maybe a paragraph or something. Well, accidentally, one time I put, uh, let's see what it was, uh, 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 say olive oil, uh, no, no, what would be, Conestoga Chevrolet. And bingo, I got in. And then I noticed when I put something that wasn't part of that time, 
it took me in for some reason. So I got away with that for three months before they closed that door on me. But I figured all kinds of doors to get all this information for free. I don't pay anything. And Google has a front door and they have back doors because they need to get that information. I, I figured that out when I read nine newspapers a day. I found out the informa- the real information was on page 43 or page 44 of section four. That's where you would find it because they have to communicate with each other. Later, I read that Noam Chomsky said the same thing. He said they have to communicate with each other. They'll never find it on page one or two. You'll always find it in section three or four. And exactly what I'd found by reading nine newspapers cover to cover advertisements and all per day, which took a lot of time being yeah. a fanatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People probably like craft their worldview around the first several pages of Google. Like when we hear just the knee jerk responses to omega threes and sugar, it's all just regurgitated top. I don't know, even 50 pages of Google, right. If you're not digging into it. I've got so many back doors like, <laughs> see, they know who, who you are. You have to pretend you're someone else. So I often pretend I'm a wholesaler and ask questions wholesalers would ask. They assume I'm a wholesaler, so they give me the inside information the other people don't get. They get the BS, and I go behind it. There's also stutter searching. There's all kinds of techniques I figured out. When I first got on the computer, I was – I had friends that had been on for, uh, I don't know, like or on the Internet for 10 years before. And I realized it was all psychology and it was all semantics uh, right away, immediately. And so I started finding stuff they couldn't find, even with 10 years experience. And I never used a link. They gave me a link. I don't want a link. Give me a name and another name and I'll put it together and. I got around it all and found stuff they couldn't find. It's supposedly hidden. Oh, Google, you can't find anything on Google. That is baloney. They're the best search engine on the planet. (laughs) I have a love-hate affair with those people. (laughs) I love it. Yeah, I like uh, when you said uh, when people on Facebook or whatever ask you for a link, you sent a picture of like a chain link. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did that a couple of times. <laughs> I have a vindictive side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to give a caveat to diabetes. And of course, all this is not medical advice. Consult your doctor, blah, blah, blah. But uh, right. with the diabetes thing, uh, because consu- we had a question, can diabetes consume white sugar? And talking about William Budd. You want to lower omega-3s if you're going to do that at the same time, right? Uh, You don't actually have to, but it should be done under under supervision because Mm -hmm. you might not be having that much uh, uh, sugar coming out. And Mm -hmm. so it really needs to be measured. This, unfortunately, is something that medicine needs to be involved with, but they're not. A lot of Ravisi cures do for cancer. Uh, An average person can't do it. In fact, sometimes I give them more like Ray Pete's perspective or Donald Lay's or someone else's perspective because I realize unless you study Ravisi for a few years before you get cancer, you're going to screw it up. It's just hard to do. Uh, I recommend some of the uh, the other cures they have. Like I wrote a book about cancer called uh, Cancer is an Evil Twin. Uh, cancer, uh, the acid alkaline thing, basically, it can be more important and how you use nitrogen and how you use uh, even small amounts of cyanide uh, to fight cancer. The old, uh, uh, what was his name? The, uh, uh, I'm, I'm spacing on his name now. He was a uh, Dr. Beard, Dr. Beard. Uh, Dr. Beard's cures were valid. Only Kelly and Gonzalez didn't follow his method. He not only used uh, uh, the uh, the protein enzyme, he used amylase, salivary amylase. And he actually said people who just use the one enzyme, it's not going to work. And that's why they're failing and why they said it. So I went back into the old books and found that people were getting their life extended two or three or four years 
by doctors who did the amylase and did the other things that were there and injected it. Very important because the enzymes are digested by the stomach in most cases, even though Gonzalez denied it. And so did Kelly. Wow. Interesting. Um, let's see. I've got a loaded question for you. Does, consu- <laughs> does consuming large amounts of sugar consistently deteriorate your brain? That actually increases the brain. Ray <laughs> Pete said, if a mother eats a lot of sugar before the kid is born, sometimes the head has problems coming out of the coming out of the uh, yes. uh, the uterus wow. because because it's uh, it creates a larger brain. Sugar is a brain growth. It runs on <laughs> glucose. That's what we run on. We don't. We are fatheads because there's. 49% by dry weight is cholesterol, but that's the linings in between. The fuel is glucose. Would would you put an oil in your gasoline to run your car? It's a carbohydrate. It's a carbon. <laughs> it's the same thing in an automobile. The brain runs on sugar or carbohydrate. Yeah, yeah. It's We're talking about, yeah, fuel. Gasoline. And, right. <laughs> A lot of people just aren't getting enough fuel. Uh, yeah. It's it's interesting. Yeah, I definitely felt the difference by just, uh, especially if I'm busy and just running around, just increasing my carbs. I definitely feel way more. Just colors are brighter. My mind's clearer. I have more energy. Um, yeah. When I under eat carbs, I don't feel the same way. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, people confuse keto with carnivore. A lion isn't a ketovore, isn't right. keto. They're they're completely <laughs> carnivore and there's no keto about it. They they manufacture they it takes starvation to be in keto. Now, when does a lion goes keto? When there's no game around and he's starving and he can only get an occasional game. But as long as there's plenty of food around, he's a carnivore. And carnivores, they don't have the same length. But they have fitness a lot of times that uh, Vegan doesn't have. Bankier was an exception to the rule. Uh, other uh, vegetarians have been really good uh, bodybuilders. But uh, there's something to be said for protein uh, in meat that you get some really strong guys that are eating lots of meat. They mm-hmm. say that Joe Miko, who was a bodybuilder, if uh, they say if he was invited to the Last Supper, it would still be going on. <laughs> <laughs> he ate so much. What What are your solutions for hypoglycemia? I don't know if we already covered this a little bit. But. You know, first of all, I would go to the mind hacking section. Hypoglycemia mm-hmm. means you're uh, you're feeling uh, that you're uh, basically not keeping up with the neighbors. <laughs> so, okay, I would look at first what in your life is uh do you feel you know that is your boss telling you you're not doing good enough is your wife telling you you're you're not doing good enough is someone telling you that and the second thing is eat sugar (laughs) eat sugar (laughs) with dietary fiber and eat whole foods and my friend had such severe hypoglycemia hugo conti he found out that by eating solar cured him completely. It took him wow. a matter of a month or two. And that's why Hugo Conti, an engineer, an ocean engineer, became on solar nutrition because it completely cured his hypoglycemia. That was a major problem in his life and that he had researched because he was a great researcher himself. So once he went on solar, He introduced it into his exercise plan, went up from 100 push-ups to 300 push-ups, increased his 30-mile runs to further, and he became a super athlete, and he did the triathlons and talked his sister into solar nutrition, too, and got completely rid of his hypoglycemia. Solar nutrition is what I would recommend, and Uh, also work on the emotion, the actually (laughs) cognitive issues. Emotions are fine. It's our brain judging our emotions where the problem comes in wow uh so kind of on the same line how much how much sugar should we consume in a day for example maple syrup and maybe we could say honey or refined sugar 
does it depend on one's kind of stress load? Yeah, you could take you could take now a normal person. I'm just I took uh, when I was doing Kabbalah and Sonic really regularly. I took two or three teaspoons in it, but I had a big cup, you know, about <laughs> about uh, half a quart. <laughs> I think I've seen uh, the picture. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that cup. I, uh, I I'm back to using it. I, I switched to a regular cup, but now I like that the Pyrex cup. Uh, so you don't really have to eat much sugar. If you feel you're in stress or have a problem, try it and see if it works. With me, it works so dramatically. I'm using it now. And because uh, yellow fat disease, it doesn't just go away. Think of it this way. When you, when you slow down on omega-3 fatty acids, it's like the rats have gone away, right? You got rid of them. There's no more rats giving you problems. But what about the electrical lines they ate? What about the the stuff they ate? That is that has to be the cells have to regrow, and that means uh, what is the function where cells split and and uh, pass? There's a there's a term for it, and that has Mitosis. to be done. That yeah. takes a lot more time. People listen to Ray Pete and say, "Oh, all you have to do is give them up for four years, and you you don't have any problems." But the damage is still there. Mm -hmm. The aging is still there. The person who finally figures out the omega-3 paradox will solve aging. We can live to 200, 300 years old. Like, a, like we can live as long as, a, uh, uh, as uh, some of those fish that don't have DHA or, or, DHA or, or EPA. Uh, when you look at it, they find, they say it's an essential fatty acid because it's in the brain. That doesn't mean it's essential. Just because it got in the brain, <laughs> is mercury in the brain an advantage to you? Is overload of yeah. iron in the brain yeah. or manganese that causes dementia or, or aluminum? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because that iron thing, you know, I went off the deep end with that for a couple of years, just believing everyone was overloaded, which is simply not true. And uh, I feel like I'll live longer just because of the fact that I tend to not store iron as much based on my blood work if yep. you could trust serum ferritin as an accurate reflection of tissue iron stores which in the literature it is um i have a red right around 70 which is i think fairly low uh so i think i have less of an issue hopefully over time with i think it's like what iron omega-3s estrogen i think you threw nitric oxide in there as well but yeah. you know it's people like my uh I have friends that have iron overload diseases have died, but that is actually, I won't even call it genetic. I'll call it hereditary. <laughs> there are certain conditions like that from certain ethnic groups that have problems with conditions. I also have friends that have low iron and one of them by using iron in, uh, let's see, what was it? T molasses and tomato juice. This one person I know, the sister of a really close friend of mine, she went to the doctor and said, you have pernicious anemia. We got to give you blood transfusions immediately. She said, no, I'm going to do with my, to take this tonic that my brother told me about. And she said, well, if you do, we're going to have to monitor you regularly. Well, when it was over, she said, you have the most, the best hemoglobin level I've ever seen. What is this formula? I'm going to put my patients on it. <laughs> what, what, and, when would you drink that for solar timing, that tonic? You would drink it midday at small intestine time or a heart time. Either one works for specific reasons. If you have a heart problem, you take it then. If you have a small intestine liver problem, you wow. take it from one to three in the afternoon. Wow. Yeah. At the end, I'll plug your, your website's because that was uh, on sunsinknutrition.com. We'll just do it now. That was my favorite thing was your uh, drink recipes. Because when I was raw vegan, I was like a blue-green algae, hibiscus. I was doing like this liquids of vitality protocol. <laughs> and pretty much that was my lunch for years. Uh, but I loved your drinks. And I actually did them, I think, a year and a half ago or two years ago. Uh, what was it? There was one with like, was it cranberry juice or grape juice mixed with something else? I can't remember there's a few there's several yeah i know i had a, the uh <laughs> the grape juice and cranberry juice together is a really i think that's what i was doing yeah <laughs> it's delicious yeah a good one <laughs>
good one. Yeah. Uh, high quality, and I was buying it in glass, the organic brands, and I would just mix them. Just have four to eight ounces or something, and I felt great drinking that. I think it was at night, right? It was, the... it was good. Is that actually... Your grape juice works better at bladder time, which is three to five, and your cranberry works better on the kidneys from five to seven. But so if you combine five, both, maybe? you can drink it at either either time. You know, it actually the cran cran grape. I think they even make a cran grape. You can take it at that time. And one time, a, a woman came into my uh, uh, health food store uh, that I manage. And I recommended she go to the liquor store and get some grape wine. And she said, I come to the liquor store and you send me to the, the... But then she found out that the only time she didn't have kidney pain was when she had a glass of wine and she was having it at kidney time at wow. five to seven. You're, you're the strongest at kidney time because your kidney is a, a major producer of strength. It's similar to a kidney. Think of it as an electric eel. That is a that is a kidney and adrenal gland on steroids that can generate electricity. You get your electrical power and shock power and manipulate your static energy through your kidneys. So if you want to be a strong man, build your kidneys. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's really interesting, huh? It's good timing because I'm getting back into saltwater aquarium keeping because I miss it. So I'm setting that up probably today or tomorrow. But electric eel, that's super cool. Um, one of the straight, one of the best ways to build <laughs> kidneys is actually get up to three to five in the morning and listen to something called the Audible Life Stream or the Sacred Life, uh, the Sacred Sound of Avila Cayasquata. I can't even pronounce it. Jeez, uh, where you have a uh, ringing your ears. The ears are kidneys. They're upside down fetuses. It's the only cartilage part where it hasn't turned to bone in your body, the euthanizer. So by simply listening to that sound, it energizes the kidney. You can actually do it any time of day. But a lung time and colon time, a large intestine time, basically from 2.30 in the morning to 7 o'clock in the morning, Really good time to build your kidneys by simply sitting and listening. You can call it meditation or just listening and listen and have, to the right ear. And eventually it will go to the center of the forehead. I've had, wow. I, I had a chiropractor say, you got, can you help me? I have a ringing in my forehead. It's not in my ears. It's in my forehead. I said, I'm going to tell you what my teacher said. He said, I, I, meditated for 18 years to get that effect and i'm not going to cure you even if i could <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> he's the only only person i've heard about it doing that he's the only feisty chiropractor up in uh, oregon that i met that that actually had the ringing in his ear the audible live stream it's a very good sign of consciousness and it means healthy kidneys wow and tinnitus is that different or could it be the same thing Tinnitus can be caused by 50 things. I have a list and I've lost it. I've been trying to find it for a decade since I got here. It got That's shuffled. a common condition. I, get, I, I mean, my dad has it. Everyone seems to have tinnitus by a certain age. If you get it in the right ear, you're okay. If you get it in the left ear, it can be high blood pressure. And both, it's kind of depends. You could get a, a, a bit of both. And there can be what they call artifacts in a circuit. Like you can have local injuries to the ear or something that cause it. But uh, on if you're not having any problems and it goes into the right ear, you're actually uh, building your body. That's the best wow. way to be anabolic. We have... Uh, the left side of her body goes down. That's why it's called male. The, the male ejects sperm. The woman accepts it on the right side. It comes up on the right side. And then on the right side, the right ear is involved with that. So this is the building ear. In acupuncture, they have two kidney meridians. The left ear is kidney time. And circulation six time used to be right ear time or the door to immortality. So they knew the power of the kidneys and acupuncture, but that's been repressed. 
you you can't find an acupuncturist who uses the door of life and the door of immortality anymore. They don't even know about it because they right. get uh, they get Mao's version of traditional Chinese medicine, which is BS. Right. It's not the original acupuncture. I, I don't know if I told you this in a previous show, but um, when I was sensory deprivation floating regularly, uh, I would start to hear a little faint ringing. And it was really interesting when there's like, you know, no light, no sound for an hour or two. Then you would start seeing things and hearing things. And one of them sounded like what you were describing. It's really interesting. Yeah. When you have normal uh, health and you feel it go over into the left ear, you can concentrate and just bring it right over to the right ear easily. <laughs> now, with high blood pressure, it becomes harder. You really have to work at it and concentrate on it. But we have control over our body. Recently, yesterday, actually, I called a friend of mine who's a psychologist and a yogi, a yoga teacher, and she's a real yogi. So I asked her how she got rid of her osteo, uh, osteoarthritis. And uh, she told me, she had studied with Swami Satyananda. And so she finally realized that the medical stuff wasn't working. So she said, cell, you're not doing your job. I went to one cell and said, you command the rest of them to get busy and do their job because they're not doing their job. And it went away. She said it took about four or five months to do, but she just kept scolding that cell to tell the other cells what to do because one cell uh, it mirrors the other cells and she got rid of it. Wow. So, yeah. I just we're, heard we're that story yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> we we're talking about Elon Musk earlier and I, I think he likes uh, like that Diablo game. I used to play it, but there's a new one out and he likes fighting demons, you know, in hell or whatever. And he says, that's a way of fighting demons in his psyche. And bringing it back to the body my mom uh healed her cancer years and years ago and she said she was through video games and she was like she wow. imagined the unhealthy cells being the enemy in the video game <laughs> and that was part of her therapy it was <laughs> you know milton erickson used to he said if you go to a person and who's dying and you tell them about doing something next month they'll live that extra month so by just telling them and the most outrageous story I heard from somebody on Facebook who, when I told uh, the story, probably about Judy Utley, something like that. She said, I had a, a case like that. I had a, uh, my grandmother, I think she said, uh, she was dying in the hospital. I think they even had a priest there and everything. And someone said, uh, we'll do this for Easter mentioned Easter is coming up. And she suddenly jumped up. I got to go make Easter dinner, dinner and got out of the hospital and lived another 10 years. <laughs> Died at 103. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. <laughs> um, let's end with a few fun questions here. Uh, this is a good one. Lights going on randomly in the house and the car. What does that mean? So when the lights turn on randomly. You know, that's interesting. Uh, we affect the environment and i noticed uh i could be in certain moods and blow out light bulbs my friend jimmy salvaggio is famous for that we would go under street lights and the light would go out and then we would go past and it would come back on i i was with him i, I saw it happen over and over and he marveled about it some we have force fields that can actually affect uh the uh, lights like that now when Swami Nidhi Gritti Adano lay, went on his, uh, on his cosmic vacation. Lights started dimming everywhere we'd mentioned his name. And uh, that was really strange. And, and it happened, we'd talk about him and suddenly the lights would dim. So we do have an effect on the environment. Uh, stress can bring it out. And even, even ecstasy can bring it out where you change the lights. Yeah, we... we uh, Rupert Sheldrake goes into that. We are not disconnected. And mind isn't in the brain. The brain is the receiver of the mind, which is outside of the body. That's why you can lose your mind. 
I always wondered about that. Well, if it's outside the brain, why, when you have a brain disease, it's because you break the transistors and the, and the parts in the brain that receive. But the mind really is outside of the body. And I can cite numerous cases that I've seen to prove that fact. Wow. Um, this is a, a fun one. And you can answer it whatever way you want. What does Adam dream about? Now, I don't know if he means when you're sleeping or dream about philosophically, but either way you want to answer. <laughs> Let's see. Dream about it. I'd like to see mind hacking spread over the world if we do it that way. And, and also solar nutrition. And uh, when I was taking Master Chen's uh, course in uh, Texas, he had us write what we our, accomplishes, our accomplishments were. And one was his work. One was Ravisi's work. One was solar nutrition. What was the fourth now? Oh, and mind hacking. Of course, and mind hacking. And so that's my dreams like that. As for my dreams, because of all the trauma we've gone through here, deaths of friends, rat invasions, uh, power outages, water outages, I dream of clinging at night and doing weird things and even hanging out with Joe Biden, for God's sake. <laughs> I'm having some of the strangest dream. Meanwhile, vibrant gal is a total yogi. She doesn't dream. Wow. And, and when she goes to sleep, it's like a log. It doesn't move. Me in my sleep, I'm trashing yeah. around. Uh, the blankets are all on the floor <laughs> and everything like that. And uh, she just, that's it. Lies on her back, out, out for the night. <laughs> It wakes up, no dreams. Wow. Which That's is awesome. Taria. Taria is the dreamless state when you achieve the dreamless state. Me, I'm not near. I'm having all <laughs> kinds of dreams. Yeah, I have a way to go as well with that. Well, we have extra questions, and I just made a note of it, and I think we're getting back on track with uh, having you on more regularly, regularly, because I kept saying that, and then it just... <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> We're finally doing it, I think, and I'll have a backlog of questions for the next show. All right. Um, and uh, I do recommend for listeners, if you guys like what Adam shared and you're intrigued, go back and listen to all our shows. And then he mentioned Patrick Timpone that he uh, he he went on Cosmic Vacation, but his shows with Adam were some of my favorites and also Extreme Health Radio. But if you really want to go deep and you have, I don't know, months to go down a <laughs> and Adam Bergstrom rabbit hole. Listen to my episodes, Justin and Kate's and Patrick's. And uh, I pretty much did that. And I, I, I really love what you share. So because um, there's just hours and hours, you could probably spend six months just you know listening <laughs> to your stuff. So um, solartiming.com and sunsinknutrition.com are the two websites. For Yep. The books are on solar nutrition and the other one is a 99. I write blogs. We have information on cleanses and purges and what, uh, what on sun sink nutrition is what? Yeah. I'm talking about <laughs> the $99 one now. Yeah. The solar timing is where the books are. <laughs> Yeah, so the timing is where we have all the books for sale and Sunsink Nutrition is where we have the $99 for things. But I've got uh, lots of books out there. Haven't written one recently. I think the last one I wrote was about uh, the endocrine glands and Kundalini versus Cosmodyne Force, I believe. But I'm not sure. Sometimes... It, <laughs> Vibrant gal will say, "You sold it. We sold a copy of this book. I wrote that. <laughs> I've written so many books. I get lost. <laughs> Do you still have copies available of the softback with Marcella von Harding? The yes, no. Oh maybe. yeah, yeah. We There's we still, still have. Okay. We're getting low, but we still have copies of that. Yeah, so we're still sending those out. We Highly send them out every two weeks now because we don't go to the market as often." <laughs> with all the strange weather and strange California politics yeah. going on here. Yeah. You know about that. Yeah. It's a weird time climate wise. Like, I don't know what's going on, but up, even up here in Idaho, it just seems the last several winters were so different from this. It's just weird. So, you know, we might even have some responsibility of that. And now this just could be coincidence. So, and it might be woo woo thinking, but Adonale, 
taught me and the group of us something called the elemental song to protect us mm. from weather. Now, I started writing a book that I haven't completed on it. Many times it has actually saved my life by singing the elemental song. Well, we decided to take it a step further last year. Uh, they said that California was going to blow away. And we had local farmers that we respect, like, and even love that were, they were going to meter their own wells and do all this stuff and put them out of business. And they were raising the, the bills on water, doubling them in some cases. So Barbara Gell and I had a conversation. Isn't it valid to do that, not only to save our lives, but to save the lives of these farmers and our fresh food, and we're eating the food too? So we started doing the elemental song when the drought was supposed to come on full, full, uh, fully. Yeah. And uh, what happened? The next day we got some rain, and then it started pouring, and then it started flooding, and we had one of the wettest years of ever, and we almost... Right back here, it almost came into the house. We were, we were, I had buckets out there and uh, the drain couldn't handle the amount of water. We had sandbags all over the place. We were under evacuation, but we didn't go. Uh, and, uh, and it kept on going and going. And we didn't do anything this year, but it's still continuing. So I don't know if it's magical thinking or whatever. But on October of 2023, 2022, I think, is when we started doing that. I've got it written down because I, I have about one third of the book written, but I had just too many stories of how the elemental song and connections with weather that uh, Donald Lay would only initiate if it rained. So, right. and I have seen someone ask for initiation and a pure blue sky and suddenly a storm. He said, let us meditate. And a storm comes, a thunderstorm shakes the house within a half hour afterwards. And the Donald wow. would say, you're accepted. Wow. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. It, it might be a bad fire season up here. So maybe I should learn that song just in case we need it. <laughs> so, I will, I will send it to you. In fact, <laughs> in fact it, it goes like this, if I can not uh, goof it up. Uh, we love you, we love you, we love you. Our dear elementals, we do. All beings of air, fire, and water, and beings of earth, we love you. I am presence, free all elementals, the great, the small. I am presence, through them give protection to all. You sing it at least four times, five times, and maybe even longer. And someone, a friend of ours, put a recording of it for four hours where they put a Dono lay on a tape loop doing it. Wow. So uh, magical thinking, woo woo, whatever it's worked for me. And it just saved my life actually about wow. five or six times. Wow. It makes sense talking about our connection with, you know, the force field affecting electronics and why wouldn't that affect our climate and our environment as well. So. Well, uh, it's, it sounds like magic when I say it, but uh, it, 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 and sometimes I'm embarrassed saying it, but whatever it did, uh, so many times when I've said it, uh, like one time, the, the first time it happened, I'm going to tell you this story. Uh, I was with Adano and we were in Flagstaff and we were supposed to eat Chinese food that night and stick around. But suddenly he said, because he had this intuition, we got to go right now. So we got in his truck and we took off. We realized we were in a blizzard really quickly. So we're in a blizzard and the windows are completely iced over except for one little hole. Now, the other passenger in the truck was named Ginger and she trusted her swami so much she thought he was driving blind but there was a little hole in the, that he could see through so we started singing the elemental song and we sang it and sang it about eight or nine verses and suddenly a lacuna opened up a blue sky above us completely blue and we were totally out of the blizzard and so Ginger got out and scraped all the ice off the windshield, still not knowing that he had had that little hole he was looking through. <laughs> wow, that's really cool. <laughs> and cool. I thought that uh, 
Many times he would relive stories I knew about. If you've ever read the biography of Ray Charles, he was in a plane. The same thing happened. The plane iced over and they were going to crash. And suddenly a little hole appeared in the windshield so the pilot could see through it. And I thought, wow, I read about that as a teenager. Is he projecting it forward? I mean, what we call linear living, I don't know. I, I don't see. I get all these feedback things and where things duplicate themselves in my life. I really wonder what's real and what's matrix. <laughs> That's so cool. Well, uh, I'll, I'll have to think of the next show. Maybe we could talk about carbon dioxide or something. We have so many books. So. <laughs> Amen. One of my favorite subjects. I love it. Well, uh, thanks so much, Adam. Uh, I'm going to close down the homestead and do some stuff before we get started. <laughs> That is all for today's show. I'm inspired finally after hearing Adam talk about Manuel Ravici so many times to read that book that I referenced, Research in Physiopathology as Basis of Guided Chemotherapy. And specifically, I want to research what Adam was talking about with the adrenal kickback after taking cod liver oil for more than six weeks. I always learn so much from Adam, and I'm glad that we're finally getting in a routine of having him on the show more often. If you want to check out his work, you can go to solartiming.com, and under the store tab, he has all of his ebooks. So you can click Adam's ebooks and tips. Under that, there's Adam's mini ebooks, and all of it is contrary information to what we're traditionally taught in the natural health community. And his other website is sunsinknutrition.com. I'm a member. I'm a huge fan. If you sign up, you can gain access to his list of all the foods and when to eat them. My favorite part of his website is actually the powerful healing combinations on sunsinknutrition.com. So under that tab, if you pay for a membership, you can see the morning hormone balancing tonic morning tonic for high blood sugar, morning tonic for low blood sugar, morning general detox tonic, morning enamel protection, morning energy tonic, and then morning hormone balancing tonic. My favorite that I've learned from Adam is definitely that grape and cranberry combo at that specific time of day. There's definitely something to solar nutrition. If you haven't tried it, I would at least dabble and even for parts of the day, try eating the foods on time and really tune in and see if you feel a difference. My website is matt-blackburn.com. You can read about my CLF protocol and then see all of my recommended products, most of which have discount codes, most of which I've talked about on the podcast and interviewed the owners of these companies. And MitoLife is my brand. You can find that at M-I-T-O-L-I-F-E dot C-O. We have numerous products on there, grounding or earthing sheets. We have really clean shampoo and conditioner. We have an undercounter. I believe it's the best seven-stage water filter to put under your kitchen sink. And under the wellness tab, you can see all of the supplements that we have, including the newest ones being lithium, melatonin, especially high-dose melatonin. And then now's a good time to try the products because we're having a surplus sale on about half the products, the jellyfish, the encephalon, which I take those every day for better brain function, really feel a difference with those. I do want to give an update with the vitamin E PUFA Protect. That's one of our best sellers. And I've just been having trouble with suppliers and jumping through hoops. So we are working to get that back and keep an eye on our social media, mine and the companies, and we'll give updates. But I'm hoping that'll be back within the next few weeks. Also, check out the Mitolife Academy on YouTube. It's $15 a month. You get two videos a month and a live Q&A the last day of the month. That is all. I'll see you guys next Friday. Stay supercharged.